What's good, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your source for our video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff. I'm Andrea Renee, joined once again in studio. Nope, just kidding. That's not this week. That's next month. Um, it's Brittany Brombacher is back. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Oi, Gav. Oi. Did you, uh, did you actually hang out with a lot of British people when you were in? No, not at all. That was totally wrong. What, uh, <laughs> what did people, what did Romans say? I, I'm going to take over everything no and kill you. <laughs> Romans uh, say? That's probably what they said. Uh, and uh, Christine Stiver is here. Hello, yes. As always. We're back together. Not in person I yet, but I would, I would, I'll send you digital hugs. This is the last episode we're all going to be together for like a month or three weeks or something crazy. Really? It's very sad. I, yeah, because Andrea's it... gone in the next two weeks, and then the week she comes back, I'm in Orlando. What? Stop leaving. Both of you, stop leaving. I'm going to quit I... the show. No, no, no. <laughs> this is it. This is all the travel I have planned. I promise, Simon. <laughs> this is her. That is her. Um, her yearly pilgrimage to Universal Studios in Florida to go to Halloween Horror Nights. Something that I want to do with you at some point, Britt, but uh, can't yeah. do it in October because I will have just come back from a trip and I just can't possibly think about flying again. Um, yeah. Good luck. Yeah, I think thankfully we have a long stretch at home. We are flying to Chicago for Thanksgiving, um, but I am hopefully going to stay here in the Bay until the Game Awards, which are coming up relatively quickly, which is why. How? Yeah. How? Because time goes by so quickly. I feel like we were recording in July and we were like, holy shit, you guys, it's July already. You guys, it's already almost the end of September. It is the end of September. What it happened? It is the end yeah. of September. It's officially the season <laughs> I have to of pay more rent next month. Oh, I was gonna get like... all cute about fall leaves and big sweaters and cozy pants, and Sam was like, "Fuck that! I gotta pay more rent money." They upped my rent by three <laughs> percent. Oh, I'm so glad it's only three percent. That's that's yeah, actually that's not the too bad. That's standard rate, I think, in LA, or at least in this part. One time I had a landlord here in San Francisco try to up our rent by $400 a month. Uh, I can beat that. We had someone try to up our rent by $2,000 a month. Wait, what? $2,000 yeah, increase? In San Francisco, yeah. <gasps> Holy crap. Somebody else bought the building and then <laughs> upped the rent by $2,000. Oh, boy. And they were like, cool, we're moving out. Bye. <laughs> yeah, well, when they upped it by $400, um, John just outmathed them. He went to our landlord and was like, listen, if you increase the, the rent and ever. we decide to leave and we're out of the apartment for X amount of days before you're able to get a new tenant in, you will have just lost that entire increase. So how about no, you're not increasing the rent? And they were like, okay, we won't increase the rent. <laughs> And then we ended up leaving like six months later anyway to move down uh, into San Mateo where we are now because uh, we wanted the studio space. Um, but yeah, it was funny how because I mean that's what he does. He negotiates all day long in his job. So he's like, listen here, landlord man. <laughs> <laughs> Drop some truth bombs on your ass. Oh, oh my gosh. But yeah, it's oh, funny. Anyway. That's why I love John. Yeah, he's yeah. the best. I love him, too. He's working hard. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming to the show. I'm sorry uh, we're kind of rambling a bit today. We are still, Britt and I are still a little jet-lagged and uh, kind of a little loopy, and, and Steimer hurt her arm somehow. Uh, she... No, it's a, that's, a, that's a recurring. That's a Steimer's life, arm lifelong, hurts. but So we're kind of um, a little bit... Out there. Um, in, in, in need of your patience uh, this week because it's going to be a whopper of a podcast I'm predicting because so a much whopper. happened this week not only in what we have been playing but also in the news so it's going to be 
It's going to be a good one, a long one probably. Uh, We're going (laughs) to go ahead and get into the news in just a minute, but we do have just a little bit of housekeeping to get into before we talk about our fantastic sponsors of this week's episode, which are Quip and Stitch Fix. But if you guys are going to be in San Jose, California for TwitchCon, we've got some exciting news. We will be making an appearance at TwitchCon on Friday, October 26th. You may have heard us previously talk about how the wonderful production crew at Twitch uh, with Miss Mary Kish, who has been a guest on the show, came out to our studio and did kind of a behind-the-scenes tour. That episode of that brand-new show is finally going to debut at TwitchCon, and so we're going to be there to to watch the debut, and we hope if you guys are planning to come to TwitchCon, you'll let us know. Uh, I think we're going to try to organize a meetup at TwitchCon so we can get together and say hi to anybody who's going to be there. We're going to work on those details. We have about a month to get you those uh but just so you guys know we will be making an appearance there and also a big thank you and shout out to everybody who joined us yesterday at the happy hour q a which is of course available to all of our members of patreon at patreon.com slash what's good games if you guys like the show if you think we're doing a good job and you want to help support the show, that's a great way to do it. Again, patreon.com slash what's good games. We have a fantastic group of people over there and uh, we hope that you join us there sometime. And that's it for housekeeping. Unless Britt, did you have something that I might've forgotten about? Nay, you nailed it. You Wonderful. surely did. You were like yesterday and I'm like, no, but then I realized, yes, <laughs> <laughs> It will have been yesterday. It will have been yesterday. The magic of podcast recording <laughs> early, ladies and gentlemen. It's all about keeping track of space and time, which is not really. I don't. Really I just right follow now. my calendar. Where should I be right now? <laughs> Calendars are a wonderful, wonderful tool. Um, let's get into some details from our first sponsor who helps make what's good games possible and that is from the lovely folks over at quip you guys have heard us talk about them before but we really love these toothbrushes and we hope that you guys will give them a shot and the reason why we love them is because when you walk down the toothbrush aisle at the store we realize that it doesn't really take long to recognize that there's a ton of options But let's be honest, most of them are gimmicks. And the truth is you really just need something that guides the simple habits most of us get wrong when we brush our teeth every day. And Quip is here to help. For starters, Quip is an electric toothbrush that's a fraction of the cost of bulkier brushes while still packing just the right amount of vibrations to help keep your teeth clean. One of my favorite parts is the built-in timer that helps you clean the dentist recommended two minutes with guiding pulses that remind you when to switch sides. So you get a nice 30 seconds on each side, upper and lower. It's all built in, ready for you. Quip subscription plans are not just for convenience, but for your health. They deliver new brush heads on a dentist recommended schedule every three months for just $5, including free shipping worldwide. Plus, if you're a traveler like us, Quip also comes with a mount that suctions right to your mirror and unsticks to use as a cover for hygienic travel wherever you take your teeth, which is hopefully everywhere. (laughs) They're backed by a network of over 20,000 dentists and hygienists and hundreds of thousands of happy brushers that use Quip every day. Plus, they were on Oprah's O-List, named one of Time's best inventions and is the the first subscription electric toothbrush accepted by the American Dental Association. Quip starts at just $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash what's good right now, you'll get your first refill pack for free. That's getquip, G-E-T-Q-U-I-P.com slash what's good and get your first refill pack on us. Thank you, Quip, for sponsoring this episode. And we'll tell you guys more about our other sponsor, Stitch Fix a little bit later on in the show. For now, let's get into some news. Holy moly, crossplay is happening, you guys. I'll take shit. I didn't expect to see today for 500, Alex. <laughs> oh, <No> shit. <laughs> this re- notice really just came out of nowhere. Now, we know that Sony has said that they are working on it and that they're talking about it internally and they were looking at solutions. But I I guess I anticipated there being an announcement that Crossplay was going to launch on a specific date, not like, hey, it's on now. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey we, got, we got the beta. <gasps> we just turned it on. I hear this on. Fortnite thing is popular. <laughs> Maybe we should help. Yeah, so this, uh, let me read a little bit um, from the 
post that was on the PlayStation blog. This, of course, is a statement from John Cadera, who is the president and global CEO of Sony Interactive Entertainment. He writes, following a comprehensive evaluation process, SIE identified a path forward supporting cross-platform features for select third-party content. We recognize that PS4 players have been eagerly awaiting an update, and we appreciate the community's continued patience as we have navigated through this issue to find a solution. The first step will be an open beta beginning today for Fortnite that will allow cross-platform gameplay progression and commerce across PlayStation 4, Android, iOS, Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, Microsoft Windows, and Mac operating systems. We see the beta as an opportunity to conduct thorough testing and ensures a cross-platform play is best on PlayStation, while being mindful about the user experience from both a technical and social perspective. For 24 years, we have strived to deliver the best gaming experience to our fans by providing a uniquely PlayStation experience, and today, the communities around some games have evolved to the point where cross-platform experiences and significant add significant value to players. In recognition of this, we have completed a thorough analysis of the business mechanics required to ensure the PlayStation experience for our users remains intact today and in the future as we look to open up the platform. This represents a major policy change for SIE, and we are now in the planning process across the organization to support this change. We will update the community once we have more details to share, including more specifics regarding the beta time frame and what this means for other titles going forward. In the meantime, please stay tuned for more information via the PlayStation blog and social channels. Oh, wow. Yeah, I have to say, I thought they were just giving us lip service for a very long time, similar to how they've given us lip service on changing your PSN name. Right. R.I.P. So I never really thought this would happen, but I guess Fortnite is such a juggernaut that they can't ignore it. I do wonder if this will fix if people are already stuck, like if people have already... So, Uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Steimer. Um, Epic Games has realized that a lot of people have this same question, and they took to Twitter today to say, um, if you have made an additional Fortnite account to play on multiple systems, one, an account merging feature to combine Battle Royale purchases will be coming in November, and two... We will enable unlinking a console from one Fortnite account and relinking to another Fortnite account coming in a few days. I think, if anything, I was expecting cross progression. I wasn't expecting them to actually do cross play, which is like, wow, that's awesome. I knew for sure. I didn't. I can't say I knew for sure. I had a sneaking suspicion that something like this would happen. But again, I thought it would just been cross progression. So this is great. And also, I think you know when they say it involves a major policy change or whatever the exact wording is, it goes to show that this wasn't as easy as flipping a switch. Unlike what Epic did last year, remember that when they accidentally turned on turned crossplay on? for a hot yeah. minute? That was so funny. So, I mean, technically, yes, they could have probably flipped a switch or caused a bug or whatever it was. Um, but, the, you know, obviously, it's not just Sony and PlayStation. They have stakeholders. They have to do a whole bunch of mumbo-jumbo to get this thing approved. So I don't know how long this has been in talks to get fixed, but I'd be curious to know how long it actually took from start to finish to get this thing done and put together. Yeah, it would be really interesting to know. And I'm also curious to see which developers are going to implement this. We obviously know that Psyonix and Rocket League have been asking for this a long time, so we can anticipate them jumping on right away. We know that Minecraft has cross-play as well. Um, But there are titles, you know, for example, Fallout 76 from Bethesda that have already come out the gate and said we will not be doing cross-play in our multiplayer and major other juggernaut franchises in the multiplayer space like Activision's Call of Duty or EA's Battlefield, you know, they haven't said a peep about whether they're going to look at cross-play as an option either because in, in when it comes to competitive multiplayer in particular, you know, when you're mixing PC players in with literally any other platform, you have a lot of, you know, balancing things you need to be concerned with. So I'm not sure how how many people are actually going to get on board. I feel like uh, this might be going out on a limb. I feel Mm. like there was a lot of like hullabaloo about something that not that many publishers are actually going to take advantage of. Do you Um, think that that is a crazy idea or do you think I'm wrong and that a bunch of publishers are going to do this? I mean, they can't just do it. I think they pretty much word in here that like this is for a select 
a select group. Right. What don't they? Let's. We're like no. I already lost. Select. Them, no, no. Yeah. Paragraph. There's a quote. Yeah. Um, the, the beta is third like third party a, content. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so once... like, not everyone and their mom will be able to do this. I even think they'll be select about who they choose. Uh, I think you're gonna have to prove that your game is some sort of money maker for them in order to. Yeah, but isn't really that... get this. Could that be a PR nightmare in a sense, though, if Sony's going to look at a, a game developer in the eye and be like, we did this for these games, we're not doing it for your games. And then that game developer comes to a website or a journalist and is like, Sony denied us, uh, unless Sony comes out right and admits what their policy is. Well, mm. I mean, sure. I just mean for right now, it's technically a beta, so they can lean on that pretty easily and be sure. like, sorry, we're just testing right yeah. now. And they can leave it as, you know, as long as they want. I'm looking ahead. I'm looking into the future. Platform policy, when it comes to hardware, is a weird, twisty, windy thing. And I know just a smidgen about it from what I've heard from developers over over my many years in the industry because it's not something that people talk about because, first off, it's, it's really difficult to understand even for people who work on the platform. But it also, like, is, is created in, in ways that – sometimes don't make sense outwardly, but make sense once you kind of like dig into the weeds of why the, a certain policy was created. I want to believe that if they're going to adopt a policy of cross play for the platform for at least one game, that they would open it up to as many games as possible, but they would leave it up to the publishers and the developers to decide if cross play made sense for their title. Now, I don't know what entails from a technical standpoint enabling crossplay. If we would see indie developers, for example, wanting to implement crossplay in their games, if that's something that they could even afford to do, because I don't know how much how expensive it is to write that tech into your code. But I don't know why you wouldn't just open it up to all of the major publishing partners if you're going to open it up to Epic Games, right? Like, why wouldn't you open it up to like 2K and Ubisoft, right? Yeah, because they don't have a game like Fortnite. Well, I mean, yes and no. Think about think about Ubisoft in particular, who is clearly focusing on live service games over the last couple of years. Games like For Honor and Rainbow Six and Ghost Recon. Neither of those games were Division. nearly as successful, but yes. I, listen, uh, Simer, I get, I get, I get that Fortnite is the most successful game, but my point is. All of those games have microtransactions in them that support them and Sony benefits when you buy microtransactions on their platform versus other platforms. So if opening up crossplay in a game like The Division 2, for example, would encourage people to buy it on PlayStation 4 so they can play with their one or two friends on PC or on Xbox or wherever, then why wouldn't Sony want to do that? I think right now their mindset is they think in their minds that it, it's a stronger argument if you don't allow it to make your friends switch to the platform that you're on. Now, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I don't, you know, but I think that that's why this is Fortnite test is happening. I think they're looking to see what difference, if it makes any difference at all and like how the amount of hours Fortnite has played on PS4 versus the other consoles and then versus how much money they're making like this will very much indicate how they move forward with this yeah i agree with that and that makes sense from a business perspective but thinking just purely from a pr perspective it's sony made this decision they're like we're not going to do this because playstation is the best platform to play this on and then everyone raised a huge stink sony's like okay yeah this is does not this does not make us look good they went back, they now allowed it. If they were to go back again and, and not allow that cross platform across you know, for certain games, I feel like that would be that would just look real bad. Sorry, I know I'm a little loopy for my jet lag, but I hope my point is coming across that um <clears throat> it, it it just it would I feel like it would be again just bad PR. Sorry. <laughs> I think bad. they would get away with it for again, for as long as it's in a quote unquote beta and since they have said select third party content. Mm -hmm. um how long i don't know but that definitely buys them some time <laughs> yeah well i think it's also worth considering i mean and i i i think there's merit to what you said um but i also think it's worth considering that the reason they did the beta with epic is because not only do they have a history of partnerships with epic 
uh, they launched Paragon exclusively on PlayStation 4, right? Uh, which really paved the way for Fortnite to be on 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 PlayStation 4 in the form that it is. But Epic also has direct access to an engineering team. So they would be able to probably move more nimbly to change things on the back end as far as like working with the policy uh, or the platform policy uh, if they needed to change things within the code, for example, in order to adhere to specific rules that PlayStation wants to put into place regarding like gating certain content or certain communities or certain countries or whatever the rules might be. Uh, that may be a reason they wanted to work with Epic versus working with like, you know, psionics. Just food for thought. That's coming. Calling it. So assuming that, you know, they do open up cross play for all of the games going forward, do you think this could be the beginning of a video game industry where console wars are basically, well, they're they're still a thing, but where it literally just comes down to the exclusives per console. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, is this the mm -hmm. beginning of five, ten years down the line where if there is a third-party multiplayer game announced, the assumption is that it's just going to be cross-play? Well, I, I think that it's always been about the exclusives when it comes to the console business and the console race, but it also will come down to what the partnerships are. For mm -hmm. example, I specifically chose to play Destiny on PlayStation because they had a partnership with PlayStation that has exclusive content, exclusive strikes, exclusive guns, um, et cetera. And so that put me into the PlayStation ecosystem for that game. Now, I, there have been times where I've contemplated starting an alternate account on my Xbox because I have several friends who only play on Xbox and I've never gotten to play Destiny with them. And the idea of playing Destiny cross-platform is so exciting for me because I love that game and I spend so much time in that world and there's all of these friends that I have that play on Xbox that I never get to talk to about it. Um, that being said, I don't think it's going to eliminate the the console wars because of crossplay. because I stand by my first statement that I don't think there's going to be that many developers that implement crossplay. I don't think it's going to be as widespread as, as some people think it might be. Or if it is going to be, it's going to take a long time for that to disseminate. Maybe even into the next generation when developers actually will build it into their game. Yeah, yeah. that's my thought too. But Britt, I, I think to your point, and Andrea's already kind of mentioned it, but exclusives are always important and that's why Microsoft just doubled down and bought like a bunch of studios at E3. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were like, oh shit, this matters. So maybe we should actually invest some money into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're gearing also, up for a really fantastic down. next Jesus generation. Christ, where is this fucking game? <laughs> God damn it, Steimer. Crack down, let it go, me out, Steimer. Just, just, no. just deal with it. I'm bad at letting things go. <laughs> just deal with it. <laughs> it's never coming. It's been canceled. Um, Jesus, if that game got canceled now, I would. I don't even know what I would do. I would be like, what the fuck is wrong with all of your development teams? <laughs> also, the timing of this announcement, because um, the new Fortnite season begins season six, tomorrow. Yeah. I think it's it, tomorrow. It's it, very soon. It began today, I believe. Mm. Oh, today. Yeah. So, hey. Today isn't the day the podcast goes up. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, season six, Fortnite. Um, I think it's the 27th. Everything we know. <laughs> Let me click on this. Do Thanks, do PC do Gamer. Transition. Something about llamas and a cube. Oh, they're like, and hey, you have ad blocker on. I'm like, hell yeah, I do. Don't I want a llama and a cube. Of course. I always pause it on, on sites that I go to, though. Let's see here. When does it start? Well, when does Fortnite the... Season 6 start? It starts on September 27th. So that was okay. yesterday from the when the podcast comes out and tomorrow from today. Cool. So, yeah, buy those battle passes. Give Sony your money. Tell them they did a good thing. <laughs> for the or love don't. of God, just don't get <laughs> angry about it. You've been bitching about it forever. I saw some people, like, being like, sure, fine, whatever, on Twitter. And I'm like, oh, my God, the internet is so frustrating. You can't, you can't appease the internet. Yeah, you, can't, you can't win with the internet. No. So. Oh. And I wrote, yeah. I saw some people writing, oh, they finally caved and like poking fun at Sony. And I'm like, dog, that's not how you get the shit you ask for. 
Be grateful. Catch oh. fireflies with honey. Oh. So I have nice things. Yeah, is, thank you, Brittany. You are correct. All right, on to our next story, which is a doozy. And I just merely titled it The Saga of Telltale Games. Because Strap in, kids. This is technically like three separate stories kind of all rolled into one. So last week, you know, at the very, very end of the week, uh, we heard the news, the very abrupt news uh, about Telltale Games closing, doing a massive layoff and running with a skeleton crew to finish remaining episodes of Minecraft Story Mode as part of a Netflix deal. And people thought, of course, what about The Walking Dead? So um, what was really great is GameSpot did a pretty good write-up, and I'm not going to read the whole thing here because it's very long, kind of dating back to March 2017 as to kind of like what went wrong with Telltale. So the announcement came last Friday, September 21st, and it said that it was enacting a, quote, majority studio closure resulted in hundreds of jobs being lost at the San Rafael, California-based studio. Um, and that includes, of course, The Walking Dead, Game of Thrones, um, Tales from the Borderland, a variety of other uh, games. Clearly, sad and shocking announcement sent waves through the industry. How could this have happened? What happens next? And they put together a timeline. So I want to just kind of skip ahead in this timeline, but if you guys want to go back, it starts with when Telltale CEO and founder Kevin Bruner announced that he left the company back in March 2017. Uh, he, it was later reported that Bruner was forced out as he clashed with the company's board of directors, and Telltale's other co-founder, Dan Connor, took over as CEO. Um, in September, if you guys remember, Telltale hired the former Zynga executive, Pete Hawley, to become this company's next CEO. Uh, before Zynga, Holly was the production lead at the Fable studio Lionhead, working alongside Peter Molyneux on that series until 2003, and then he spent some time with Sony and then at EA. All right, fast forward to September 2018. Um, Telltale informed the employees, according to Variety, that its negotiations with media giant AMC for more funding were, quote, going well. With the company expected to complete the funding process in the coming weeks, there was also reportedly a deal being negotiated with the South Korean mobile game giant Smilegate for more funding. Uh, both companies apparently left their negotiations with Telltale on Thursday, just hours before an eventful Friday. The reports offered no explanation for why AMC and Smilegate left the negotiations on the same day, and Variety had previously reported that the movie studio Lionsgate also decided to pull out of a financial deal with Telltale. Uh, according to other reports, uh, Telltale Games holds a meeting uh, last Friday where it informed more than 200 developers they were losing their jobs right then and there. According to Variety, employees were given paper paychecks for pay through the end of the day. They were then reportedly instructed to leave the building within 30 minutes. Employees <laughs> were allowed back in for a period of three hours on the following Monday to collect their personal belongings. The affected staffers received no severance pay. And their health care cover reportedly only extended until the end of the month. Management told employees that they should consider applying for unemployment benefits. Former Telltale CEO Kevin Bruner wrote a blog post on his personal website talking about he clashed with Telltale's board of directors and the future of the company. He shared no more information about what he and the board disagreed over. Telltale's board of directors includes Lionsgate CEO John Feltheimer and former Electronic Arts CEO John Ricatello, which... Everything he touched turns to fucking ash. Um, Telltale's official statement explains that the company is undergoing a major studio closure with only around 25 people remaining on board to fulfill the company's obligations to its board and partners. Pete Hawley, the CEO, says it was an incredibly difficult year filled with insurmountable challenges. He said he's proud of Telltale's efforts, but at the end of the day, did not translate to sales. Dan Connors told Variety that Telltale had no choice but to stop production after it failed to close another round of financing, saying, quote, sadly, everyone was so focused on doing what was required to keep the company going that when the last potential partner backed out, there were no other options. Bullshit. Yes. So before I go into the class action lawsuit and the next step of this, I just want to stop and like digest this for a second because that's fucking horrifying. Like the idea that a company would think that that's even an acceptable idea <laughs> that this is how we're going to handle the firing of over 200 people is just despicable in every way. And this is how you don't yeah, run a business. 
No, not at all. And I've been part of a layoff before and they're hard no matter how good the company is to you. If the company's like, we're going to give you six months of severance and six months of medical care and you can keep working for the next month if you want to, but you don't have to. And like they give you like they roll out the red carpet on your way out the door. Like even if even if they do that, it still is a gut punch and it sucks and it hurts. And the idea of having to upend your life is chaotic at, at, at best. And it's it's a shitty place to be. I don't know if either of you have ever gone through a layoff before. Mm -mm. I've been around when other people have gotten laid off. Yeah, I've been in both situations where I was the one person less standing on my machinima team of about 14 people. I was the only one who didn't get fired. And I was like, um, this, th wait, how, how am I supposed to do all of these people's jobs? Um, but also... I've been part of a, a, a layoff of one of my producing jobs um, at a dot com company in early in my career. And it's and at that when I got fired, then well, I didn't get fired. It was, it was a redundancy. They eliminated my entire department. Um, all of the producers got got let go. We got two weeks of severance. And even that was like two weeks, man. That's like one paycheck. I don't I don't yeah, know what I'm going to I don't know what I'm going to do. And here in the state of California, applying for unemployment is actually semi-difficult because so many people do it and so the state has relatively strict rules and so with this company being based in california particularly being based in the bay area and knowing how expensive it is we just talked about rent <laughs> it's not yeah. much show. like my heart just breaks for all of these people it, what's even more shady there's a lot of shady things about this whole situation is on september 20th apparently management told their employees that the negotiations were going well but then at the 11th hour, these companies backed out. That sounds like a just a freaking lie you told all of. You know whether or not negotiations are going well or not. So it's not like these companies backed out at the last, oh, we totally didn't see that coming. Bullshit. And also, if you are that down to the wire, that also doesn't have a uh, – that doesn't seem right either. This reminds me – a lot of uh what was the name of that studio in rhode island 31 or something oh you're talking about kurt something? schilling's studio yeah 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 Let me like when the they, it, they did something similar it was kind of just like you people walked in and were let go immediately 38 and I don't think studios they got... what 38 studios was the name of the 38 studio. shit i got the wrong number but i was close 31 i just add seven it's fine um but uh and by the way yeah, just as a reminder Kurt Schilling paid $2.5 million on a settlement over what happened at 38 Studios. Yes, as well he should have. That was also, also very bad. Also, this quote were, by... Sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, but they were at least in Rhode Island, which, granted, I actually don't know the price of living, but I don't think is anywhere near the astronomical bullshit that is the Bay Area. This quote by Dan Connors, the co-founder, it says... Sadly, everyone was so focused on doing what was required to keep the company going that when the last potential partner backed out, there were no other options. Bullshit. There's just so much wrong with that. If you are the co-founder or the CEO of a company, you, ha you there are so many options I feel like you can exhaust. And you you can tell when things are going wrong. The, this isn't like this came out of nowhere. I feel like they lied to their employees. They try to put a you know, hunky-dory face story to it, and then shit hit the fan. And they're like... Sorry, guys. It's just, it's such bad management. It's just really sad. It's it, just really the, shitty. The really frustrating part is that they know what their run rate is. So, like, a common a common figure in game development is kind of, like, knowing what your burn rate is, right? Like, how much your studio costs to keep open and running on a day-to-day -day basis, on a month-to-month -month basis, on a, and, a, and on a yearly basis. So, like, when you go to a potential investor for a project, like let's say Telltale were to approach a platform like Xbox and say, hey, Xbox, we want to do an exclusive series for Minecraft Story Mode. It's only going to be available on Xbox. Um, and we want you to fund it. And this is how much it's going to cost. And part of that part of that budget is the studio's burn rate. Like this is how much it's going to cost us to, to make this game because it's how much our employees cost and et cetera, et cetera. So like the idea that the the executive staff has this knowledge and knows what their runway is going to cost them, but then it said hung at all on this one round of funding, and then they closed the next day 
seems so suspicious that yeah. I, I don't even like know where to begin. And I really hope the details of what went wrong eventually come to light and that Pete Hawley as the CEO, regardless of if, if it was his direct fault, it was his, it's his indirect fault at the way this all shook out because as the CEO and the leader of that company, he has say over the all of the policy of the company. Um, and it's just, it's just so infuriating to me, the idea that these people were given no notice, given a paper check for their pay through the end of the day. Like, that's just so gross. It's just so disgusting. I don't even like have words to describe no. it. So, which leads me to the next part of the story. Of course, these employees pissed off, banded together and said, fuck Telltale, we're going to hit them with a class action lawsuit. Um, so this write-up comes from Polygon. Um, a former Telltale employee is suing the company in a class action lawsuit alleging that it violated labor laws on the books in California and nationwide when it laid off hundreds of employees last week. The complaint filed in federal court in San Francisco is a class action suit submitted by Vernie Roberts on behalf of himself and his fellow laid off workers. In the complaint, Roberts says that Telltale, which is based in San Francisco suburb San Rafael, uh, let go of employees, quote, without cause and without providing them, quote, advance written notice as required by the Warren Act. The Federal Workers Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act, which became law in 1988, stipulates that most businesses with at least 100 full-time workers must notify employees 60 days in advance of any plant closings or mass layoffs. The act defines a mass layoff as a reduction of 50 or more employees within a 30-day period. If the total comprises at least one third of the company's workforce or any layoff of 500 or more workers, California state level version of the Warren Act, which is even stricter because the, the labor laws here in California are actually quite rigid, uh, which took effect in 2003, uh, lowers that company size threshold to just 75 full or part time workers and applies any reduction of at least 50 employees. Both the state and federal laws require an advance notice of 60 days. Um, clearly this, uh, just on paper, it looks like this layoff qualifies. However, um, I wanted to just continue reading here. The plaintiffs are requesting a jury trial and are seeking to win the aforementioned compensation for the laid off employees an amount equal to the wages and benefits that the workers would have received if their employment continued for 60 days after the termination, plus interest in accordance with the federal and California versions of the act. Plus um, interest. That's amazing. Yeah. They're like, because we know how long court cases can take. So I mean, you, yeah. you got to ask for it. I mean, I'm surprised I haven't asked for yeah. damages. Um, so there was an update. Telltale may be able to fight the lawsuit on the basis of the federal Warren Act, but it will likely have a tougher time defending its actions according to the California v versions of the law. This update comes from Games Daily. Uh, Game Daily, it's a publication. The federal law offers some exceptions for businesses, situations in which a company would be exempt from the 60-day advance notice provision. The exemptions include, quote, business circumstances that were not reasonably foreseeable, end quote. Variety I don't reported think that's on true. <laughs> in a court of law, every every word makes a difference. Variety reported Monday that Telltale was working to secure a round of financing, but the last possible backer, which may have been Lionsgate, uh, pulled out, forcing the studio to initiate shutdown plans and lay off most of the team. Attorney Richard Hogue, who spoke to Game Daily, said that in light of Variety's reporting, Telltale may be able to cite the Warnax business circumstances exception in its defense. However, the California counterpart does not feature any such clause. Quote, the fact that California did not bring over the pertinent exemption would seem to put Telltale in a precarious compliance position with the state. This is just Whoops. so sad and so shitty. I, I hate this. I hate everything about this. Telltale, I mean, I love their games. You know, the, the few I did play. And it's just, this is just so bad. My my wonder, though, is if they are, I mean, rightfully, they should be sued. And it sounds like they violated the shit out of everything. But if there's no company, where do you get your money from? There's still 25 people. Right. But it sounds like they don't have a pot to piss in, let you alone. imagine being one of those people working on Minecraft right now? And you're just Fuck. like, why would I even want to do this? You wouldn't. Yeah. Like, morale has got to hit, like, hit rock bottom. But I'm sure they're grateful that they still have a paycheck coming in for yeah. however long that might be. Um, That's true. Some people don't, you know, don't have the luxury to be pissed off and quit just because they're mad, right? Um, and it's, 
it's frustrating that these people now have to go through the court system to try to get the compensation that they should have just been given. Um, obviously, a lot of Telltale's developers have taken to social media to talk about how they feel about the situation, uh, which is not great. Um, and one of them had mentioned uh, that his he was recommending for people to not work overtime because he talked about the nights and weekends he spent crunching to finish these games anticipating he if he ever left the company they would take care of him and he's like I, I they basically just told me all of my hard work was for nothing they pr- gave me the bird and told me to be on my fucking merry way and gave me wow. no overtime so he's like if you're not getting paid for your overtime hours stop working it and of course this is reinvigorated discussions about unions within the video game industry whether they're good or whether they're bad And um, it also, on a more positive note, has highlighted the camaraderie in the video game industry. When this news broke and when the news of the Capcom Vancouver shutdown also broke, we saw tons of studios uh, tweeting their support, um, posting links to open job sites, to using the hashtag to let people know where they could refer people who want to apply for positions and I think that that's something that's really amazing about this industry that we don't really see in a lot of others out there that when there's like a mass layoff at a company like Salesforce, like I don't see other marketing agencies like jumping up to be like, hey, guys, hey, come come work for us. Right. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, because our industry is so small and intimate. Um, also, you know, this is obviously very, very unfortunate, but. My hope is if anything good come out of this, it can come out of this. It's that, you know, this isn't the first time we've heard about studio conditions being like this, working so much overtime, getting treated like shit, not being compensated for the extra work they're putting in. Hopefully this highlights the fact that this is not okay. And if news gets out that you're pulling this shit, you're going to get called out and you're going to have a bad time. Studios and everyone will jump all over your shit and call you out. You'll be sad because you suck. Yeah. I just, I mean, treating people with, with some dignity, you know, like, I just, I can't imagine being in the room at the desk where they decided to make this call. Like, I hope to God somebody, whether it was Dan or somebody else on that team said, this is wrong. We can't do this. You know, like the idea that they ran the company so close to being out of money that they just had to abruptly pull the plug on everything, like quite literally, like just like took everybody's computers away to be like, oh, well, you know what? Yesterday we ran out of money. Goodbye, everybody. We have to Uh, liquidate everything, including your chair. That's just not how businesses are run, you know? Like the idea that that's what happened. I was just like, I hope somebody on the inside was like, this is fucked up. This is really fucked up, you guys. I guarantee Jason Trier is out there somewhere (laughs) doing his thing. around. Getting getting the story. I hope so. (laughs) It's just bad business. So, I mean, obviously, that's like the, the, the least. It's just bad business, terrible, like CEO. It's just, and it's such a bullshit story that, oh my goodness, we ran out of money. Everything. It's just, it all is just so gross. Just awful. Yeah. And I don't even I think what bothers even, me. Oh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead, Steimer. No, I was, I was just going to say, like, what bothers me most about Telltale in general was that they had an interesting concept. And everybody told them exactly what their problems were, and yet they never pivoted. Yeah. And then they decided to do this crap. Yeah. And just treat everybody like a cog in a machine, which, yes, in some ways we all are. But good Lord, to be reminded of it in such an indignant way is not great. Yeah. No, indeed. And like, I, what I was going to say is I don't think, like, even if they came forward with what they deem a legitimate reason for why they handled it the way they did. I don't think I would give them a pass. I don't think I would be like, Oh, well that makes sense. Now I understand why you did what you did. I would be like, nah, dude, you fucked this up. Like I I understand your reason, but you didn't have to do it this way. Like right. you could have business you, there could have been another decisions. way. <laughs> exactly. Business decisions are best for the business, but there are humans behind your business and you have to treat them with dignity and respect. And there is a way to deliver these hard messages. And giving them 30 minutes and a paper check to GTFO is just like the worst possible thing. Awful. Yep. Uh, we do have one final part of this story. Uh, we have a Dear WGG uh, question. Of course, if you guys are ever interested, what's goodgames.com slash Dear WGG. Uh, Timu 
Polkinen. Polkinen? I don't, know if, I don't know if I said your name right, Timu. I'm sorry. It says hi, Andrea Britton Simer. The news about the closing down of Telltale Games has been a has been huge, and I would like to know what were your favorite Telltale game titles, and how do you think the closing down of the studio will affect the market of episodic game series? Before we get to that, I just want to touch on what uh, the episodic game series because their final game that they were working on. Well, I guess technically Minecraft will be their final game. The Walking the Dead final game they finished will be Minecraft. Yeah, the final season has been pulled off of shelves because, of course, the second episode of that just came out this week, weirdly. Um, and uh, they said, quote, we're currently still working to find a way to hand off production of episodes three and four so that the season can be completed. The outcome of those efforts will determine when and how the final season returns to stores. We hope to have a firm announcement for the end of the week. For now, we apologize for any inconvenience. And they uh, gave that notification to polygon because there was a lot of confusion about the fi the walking dead it's like it's not getting finished they're trying to get it finished same with stranger things is netflix shopping it is it dead in the water we don't have the answers for those questions yet but um thank you but for your... i there was a lot of i want to talk about the reaction to this because i found that very interesting so telltale not fires everybody like peace out we have no money but then it's like bt doves we're hopefully gonna finish the walking dead somehow getting money from somewhere and at first i think people were like oh my god yeah i get my thing that i paid for but what i liked is how then developers came out or like this is kind of crap like you can't you didn't pay, treat any of the people who originally worked on this well and now you're trying to get yourself some money to hand it off to somebody else to somehow finish this like what a what a slap in the face for anybody who has poured their heart out into this series to be like you don't get to finish it but we're gonna try and shop it around and let somebody else do it. Why didn't you um, shop it around before you ran out of money? Have you yes. heard of crowdfunding, ladies and gentlemen? It's a thing that sometimes works miracles. This is this is the example that Greg and I were talking about on Games Daily earlier this week, and I didn't go as much into detail there, but Double Fine came back from the dead because of Kickstarter. Like they yes. were on the ropes. This like historic studio has done that's done so much for video games, particularly in the adventure genre, like was was almost in this position. Like I hope to God that the wonderful person that is Tim Schafer would never have treated his employees like like the Telltale employees got treated. I have to believe that he wouldn't knowing him. He is a great person. But they were in a really tough spot financially a few years back, not even that long ago. And so they went to Kickstarter and said, hey, we, if you guys like what we do, we need your help. And the community said, we love you. We'll help you. And then they gave them like $3 million. <laughs> and then they were like, holy shit. Yeah. This is a, thank God. Yeah, like we were, we were the hedge funders. Is that what it's called? I don't know. <laughs> no, angel investors. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not very up to date on these terms. Yeah. But. Yeah, we give them money. Uh, Angel yes, investors give you money is, is you make it's a not thing. quite the right term, but it's okay. We can use it anyway. It's close enough. I'm gonna call it angel investor. But yeah, Swooping I'm with you, Britt. In, there, the day. there was options. There was there was definitely things that they could have done instead. This is clearly a decision their board of directors made, um, and it was it was just the it's just the wrong call. It was just they just fucked it up. Everything about this is fucked up. <laughs> si up ways, sideways, left ways, right ways, upside down ways. Just bad news. Just just bad. Um, so I do want to end um, this. Wait. Oh, Timu's question. We yes. have to ask no, no, no. I, no, that's what I was going to say. I want to oh, end this oh, segment, okay. this section of the news on a high note by talking about our favorite Telltale titles. Um, and that way we can kind of remember why Telltale was important. Also, I want to let you guys know, uh, Ryan McCaffrey over at IGN uh, wrote a great story about Telltale's impact on video game development. And if you're interested, you can check it out over on their site. Um, it's, it's a really great article talking about the importance of what they did and how it had ripple effects in game development. But um, Britt, do you have a favorite Telltale game? I think the one I enjoy the most was The Wolf Among Us. Um, also the walking dead season one had a, was huge for me. I'd never played a game like that. I love the walking dead. I love zombies, obviously. And that final decision you make at season one was so profound. And it's just one of those first, holy shit moments. Um, ah, it just makes me so sad. Yeah. That one hurt. Yeah. Literally. Uh, 
That's why, like, so I, I juxtaposition, like, season one of Walking Dead with Tales from the Borderlands, because Tales from the Borderlands is so nice and fun, and, like, they did really cute things with the way, uh, with gameplay in that, uh, game. There you <laughs> so go. I don't like saying words like that. But anyways, um, so yeah, like, those are two of my favorites. I also really did love Wolf Among Us, and I'm bummed that I won't see that ever again, but at the same time, it has kind of been a while. I was kind <laughs> it's of... Been a while. It's been a while. Uh, oh shit! Well, now that's yep. Okay, cool. I'm done. That, those were those were. <laughs> I totally sidetracked you. It's okay. <laughs> Andrea, what were yours? Um, I'm with uh, I'm with you, Britt. Uh, the Wolf Among Us was one of my favorites, but The Walking Dead season one was probably my most favorite. I also really enjoyed Game of Thrones and Tales from the Borderlands, but I just, uh, I think. What was great about The Walking Dead season one is that it really put Telltale on the map. You know, this was a studio that was kind of just puttering along, doing really neat things with narrative, with games like Back to the Future and, and Jurassic Park. And obviously, like, what was that? Type? Serious Sam back in the day and a, a, a variety of other Sam stuff. And Max? Sam and Max. That's what I'm thinking of. Uh, Serious Sam, different franchise. <laughs> yeah, I was like, no, I don't think that's it. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, I remember early in my career in the video game business going to CES of all places and going to a sweet meeting where we were looking at like just you know barely anything for concept art for what the wolf among us was going to be and seeing rough sketches of of the walking dead and and really not even understanding like what the concepts of these games were going to be and and seeing how far they came from there. And obviously, like, there will be plenty of postmortems happening about what Telltale did wrong as a studio uh, from a production standpoint. And, of course, they made some mistakes. We have talked about some of those mistakes on this show. But what they did overall, I think, was really profound and really neat. And I think that it helped pave the way for games like Life is Strange, a game that we really love on this show and other narrative games and really kind of help renewed a, a sense of ad adventure in games and the adventure genre. I mean, they've always been there, obviously, but I mean, I think The Walking Dead really put them back on the map in a big way. And that was really exciting that that genre that really, you know, kind of had this genesis back in the PC era kind of had this resurgence with a whole new generation of gamers. And I think that there's a lot to be said for the impact that Telltale had on that on that um, comeback. So those were some Absolutely. of my favorites. I, the, this, this news though, like did make me a bit nervous for developers. Like uh, those like don't nod and people behind episodic games. Me just wondering then, is this just the way, is this just the nature of them? And are those teams suffering too? Like how, like, or are they more well managed? Was it just really bad management at Telltale that made making these uh, episodic games so hellish I don't know uh, but because he asked how this would affect the market of episodic games and I mean I, I guess it, we'll see on whether or not it um, has any impact on them whatsoever but I think that that's always up to this individual studio how they treat their employees and also just what their ROIs are like what their run costs are versus what those episodes are making. For me, I, I had the telltale fatigue where I felt like every game was just more or less the same. I mean, it played the same. You got a different story. And plus the engine was just so gnarly and it just, uh, I didn't have much desire to hop into these series like the Game of Thrones and the Borderlands one. I was like, whatever. But I think with developers like Don't Nod, you know, you see what they did with Life is Strange and you see how Life is Strange 2, I just finished the first one, how they're doing things different enough where it doesn't feel like that burnout has even a chance to exist. So I think, again, like you said, it just depends on the management and the innovation of the studio. Well, and that project is being funded by Square Enix, a massive company that mm -hmm. has resources, right, and has shown over decades that they know how to run a business. <laughs> um, I mean, sometimes they make weird decisions, like not release games for ten years, like Final Fantasy. But you know that you know that's okay. Um, but it's not okay. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, that gives me confidence that as long as there's you know, a major publisher on board to help kind of cushion any kind of financial blow that a, a, a title might 
uh, undergo that, you know, hopefully we don't see something like this happen again where a g- episodic game is canceled mid release. Because in video games, yeah. like, g- games get canceled all the time. You know, we have reported on several that have gotten canceled this year, but getting reported when they're or getting canceled when two of the four episodes haven't been released is ca- like that's a head scratcher. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. you really, you fucked up your books real bad on that one. Oh, no kidding. Especially all those people who have season passes. I'm sure they're not getting their money back, but still it's. I, I would think oh. they have I just to. can't like they had such big, the thing that, that blows my mind is the fact that they had such big partners. They have AMC's walking dead. They had guardians of the galaxy. They had game of thrones. They had people with money on board. So either they just like, super undercut themselves which would be real dumb but maybe they did um and they were just like super like no we only need this much even though they really needed yay more uh i'm so, i'm so eloquent today don't you like my business numbers? we're all in our game we're all in our game <laughs> today you needed this instead of this uh, i used my fingers to youtube.com slash what's good news yeah. <laughs> i know what you're trying to say steimer and it's an interesting concept the idea of how those negotiations for their licenses went because on one hand you would think if you're doing a negotiation with someone like netflix for stranger things which clearly had a runaway success of its of its first two seasons that they would say um we have all this money but i having worked with brands and licenses before A lot of these brands say you have to pay for the privilege of working with our brand. You know, like the idea that, you know, the barrier to entry to make a game about this specific license might end up costing a studio more than they would actually make from the project um, at at the start of the negotiation. Then why would you keep doing it? That's the question, right? (laughs) Well, this this is the thing, right? Wasn't there a studio recently that talked about licensed games was it platinum maybe or somebody that said that they can't afford to do licensed games anymore and so they just stopped making it and are focusing on original ip let me see who this was. hey i mean yeah and that's i mean it makes sense in certain uh realms i just thought like they were doing it so frequently it gave an impression that they would be receiving yeah. a monetary benefit from doing these it's just and... so crazy i remember whenever telltale would get a new license everyone would lose their shit oh my god they're tackling this they nailed walking dead this is what they're doing everyone was so excited and to see it crash so hard it's just what the hell was that stammer oh it's a uh, it's amazon oh youtube.com such what's good game stammer oh. just got freaked out by amazon well hold on off she goes. Steimer is now retrieving her package because you see, ladies and gentlemen, Steimer lives in an apartment complex and people are package snatchers. Don't be a package snatcher. Don't steal other people's good. shit. No, they paid for that. Did you pay for that? Did you flip burgers for eight hours to, to earn that hair dryer off of Amazon? I don't think so. Nope. See? Oh my gosh. My fucking ad blocker is fucking me up. Okay, so it, it was Platinum. It says Platinum Games wants to publish its own new IP. Mm. Um, I would like to say, never in my life have I had someone insist on being like, that package is for you. Me being like, yes, you could have just left it outside of my door, but okay. I want someone to teach a course on development licenses, cycle, like all of the things. Because I feel like when we have these stories, we can only talk so much about it, but we don't actually know how the industry works in and out. I would be so fascinated to learn that stuff. If there are any good resources, let us know. I bet I'd you there's at least one talk from in the GDC vault about this. Um, cool. if some enterprising young individual wants to look, but, um, we do want to put a pin in this conversation cause we have been talking about it at length and there is some other news stories that we want to get to. I want to transition into a fantastic story, a feel good story, something that will hopefully lift us up out of this like cranky, terrible spot where you've just been in for the last 40 minutes. Um, glad has added outstanding video game category to its media awards. So this write up comes from game industry, biz, the LGBTQ advocacy group. Glad has announced that it will add an outstanding video game award to its 30th annual glad media awards later this year. This will be the first time the organization has recognized video games in its award. The outstanding video game award will be presented to a game with outstanding LGBTQ inclusive content and can be accepted either by a developer or publisher. That content includes authentic and impactful LGBTQ characters or storylines. And the judges will also consider how much of that content is a seamless or prominent part of the gameplay and world. To be eligible, the game must either have been released in 2018 or had a substantial content update during the year. 
with the considered representation included in that content. Major console platforms, PC browser, browser and mobile games all qualify. Nominees will be announced in January with the awards taking place on April 12th, 2019. Cool. Woo woo. Yeah. Not too much to talk about there. Just it's awesome that um, they're recognizing video games as an art form and recognizing that um, LGBTQ representation is something that is becoming more prevalent in video games. And I think it will be good to highlight the developers who are working on that kind of content. So I just wanted to say that's cool. Um, next, uh, this is an interesting story. So no. you guys may have heard about the fantastic feature of Nintendo online service when we talked about when they launched that you can keep your cloud saves if you pay for Nintendo's $20 a year fee. But they announced that if you let your subscription expire, poof, your cloud saves are gone. And thus the internet became enraged and very upset. And then they were forced to clarify their position. Um, this story comes from Eurogamer. One of the more vexing revelations to emerge concerning Nintendo's new paid online service prior to its launch on Switch last week was that cloud saves would seemingly be deleted immediately on a user subscription lapsing. Nintendo has now clarified this is not the case. News of Nintendo's apparently draconian cloud save policy came via the company's official UK website, where an FAQ on the new online service stated, quote, save data stored with save data cloud cannot be kept outside of the duration of your Nintendo Switch online membership. Understandably, some fans weren't pleased. Not only had Nintendo elected to place the only means of backing up Switch saves behind a paywall, those precarious backups would seemingly be automatically deleted upon the expiration of Nintendo online account. By the way of comparison, PlayStation Plus cloud saves are stored for six months once the subscription lapses before removal, and Xbox One subscription-free cloud saves are retained indefinitely. The company has finally confirmed in a statement provided to IGN that, as is the case with PlayStation Plus, if a Nintendo Switch online membership expires users won't be able to access their cloud save data backups however nintendo will allow users who resubscribe within 180 days to access their previous save data cloud backups guarantee you nintendo did not even know what their own policy was when they published that shit yep. it wasn't until the internet went to store that like <laughs> oh goodness what are we gonna do oh i don't know what's playstation doing let's just copy them i love nintendo i love them a lot but i mean like they the may have had this but just didn't think to message it but how could you're, you're nintendo this is like you you're in the video game industry okay. you know what i'm saying like <laughs> what stiver <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, okay, listen. All I'm saying is that you can't tell me no one at Nintendo knew that by not clarifying this, this is what people were going to take and run with it. And of course people are going to ask questions because their save system is so freaking wonky. Your save files, ladies and gentlemen, it saves to the hardware itself. There's no way to say, to transfer your save files. You have to literally opt in to Nintendo Online, which I admit it's cheap, $20. That's not bad. You get a lot of bang for your buck, but it's the principle that in order to have your saved data saved in the cloud, you have to opt into this. There's no place to use a USB. There's no SD card. You literally can't do anything. You can't data, move but do your this. save files to the to the card that you put into your Switch. No, you, the save files are all saved to the the Switch natively. Wait, seriously, that's not an option to move the files. No, no, that's outrageous. I know. I didn't know <laughs> that. <laughs> yes, I thought that you yes. could move your files like you move the game save, like the game the game data. Right? Like you like install games on the card. You can choose when you download it where you're installing it. You can't choose to move your save data to the memory card? No. Oh. oh my god, Nintendo. Seriously? No, it's saved to the Switch itself. Tra -la 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 -la, tra -la -la -la. So that's why that's, that's why cloud saves are <laughs> cloud saves are such a big deal. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it is what it is. Not only that, not all games support cloud saves. So like there's literally no way to back up your shit. Games like Pokemon Let's Go, Splatoon, Dark Souls. Now Nintendo has issued a oh, statement. Yeah, and we've is... got a Dear WGG about yes. that. You want to read it? I I would love to. Hold on. Let me stop breathing fire out of my face. Okay. <laughs> this comes from Andrew Wimpy. Some people discovered on Reset Era that some Switch games, mainly multiplayer games like Splatoon 2, won't support cloud saves when Nintendo Switch Online service launches. In Nintendo's statement to Kotaku... 
Most Switch games will support them, but others won't to prevent cheating in online games. Is this a big deal? Especially since there's currently no other way to back up save data on the Switch. And does this shake your faith in Nintendo's online service for the Switch? So this That would is... imply that we had faith in it to begin with. <laughs> Word, Steimer. No, you're, you're totally right. So I had a quote, but now I can't find it, F from Nintendo talking about why. So basically their, their worry about the online cheating is that if you save your data locally or whatever, you could do something in the cloud, save it in the cloud, and then delete your cloud data, and then manipulate your items that you have. So basically manipulate your different saves, your cloud saves and your local saves, in order to maybe get items back that you had traded or something along those lines. How do they think literally Paxilors. everybody else does this? Thank you, and that's that's what I'm saying. It's it's not, <laughs> it's a big deal because, like I said, I, Nintendo tries to reinvent the wheel. There are pr online games and online shit in general is not new. People have gone through the trials and tribulations of figuring this shit out. Why don't you just learn from them? Why are you making an online app to go with your online service? I mean, they like, seem why? to be pretty chummy with Ubisoft these days, you know? Miyamoto-san has appeared at the Ubisoft press conference the last two <sighs> years. Why don't they just call their friends at Ubisoft up and say, hey, can you uh, oh. can you show us how to do cloud saves? <laughs> can you show us how to do a lot of things? But mostly, yeah, just online service. <laughs> it's, again, it's, it's just that thing that I, I'm very passionate. I love Nintendo very much, but hot diggity damn. And can we talk about those $60 NES Joy-Cons? Can we just talk about those for a second? Sure. Now, granted, I get it. You don't want them. You don't have to buy them. Totally optional. But oh, how are of you? Of course, you want them. How? I, oh, yeah, I'm. Gonna, I'm totally gonna buy them too. But I hate. I hate it because I'm gonna buy them. I'm still gonna no, bitch about so it. Just so people are aware, you're talking about the wireless NES uh, replica controllers uh -huh. that slide exactly onto the Switch. Okay. Right. So yeah. So these. So, okay. In order to even purchase these NES. Joy Cons for your Switch, you have to opt into their Nintendo Online system. And the reason for that is because those controllers only work with their NES titles. Now they're cute, and I understand they're functional and it's adorable and nostalgic. However, they're $60. So you're saying you want people to spend $60 on a controller that they can only use with a select amount of NES games. And oh, when the regular and Joy they're Cons are going to sell out too. They have sold yeah. out, haven't they? Oh, I don't know. I didn't know that they're not shipping until December. I, I was on the cruise when all this broke, and I missed my opportunities of life. Up. Anyway. I mean, you probably should be grateful for that one in particular. I know I'm complaining. I'm going to buy these if I can. But it's just, it's just. Why don't you just get, like, cute skinned Joy-Cons? They're actually more expensive than they're these. Because they're not, they're not like the NES controllers with little buttons that are going to break your hand after five I was five about to say, but your poor hands. I, oh, I know. So they got raptor claws after using the Yeah, when these came out in the, in the direct, I tweeted a photo of them, and somebody in my Twitter feed was like, those look so uncomfortable. And I was like, dog, that's all we had back in the day. <laughs> oh, yeah. We didn't have grips. Wait, are they the same curvature? No, I don't think so. No, they, they look exactly identical to the, the original NES controller, that, that rectangular box. You know, the mm -hmm, gray mm -hmm. and black and red design with the red buttons, the two buttons and the D-pad. Yeah, for some reason I thought these were smaller, though. That's all I'm saying. No, I think they're the oh, same size. Small. Oh, maybe they are. I haven't really looked into oh. it, but anyway. Cool. Yeah, I haven't looked into it either. It's fine. Because I will, I will not, in, in my on-brand fashion, will not be buying them. But yeah. I have been very tempted to buy skinned that look like SNES Joy-Cons because they're yeah, those are so super pretty. But they're so expensive. The they are. the Super NES Joy Cons. Yeah. Are you talking about the ones on Etsy? They're not Nintendo. What? You talking about the custom ones on Etsy? Yes. Yeah, they're like a hundred and thirty bucks, aren't they? Yes, they are insanely expensive, well, which is why I have not purchased them. them. That's probably why. But I want them. I want them very much. <laughs> well, it's because the Joy Cons themselves are so expensive. Eighty bucks for the Joy Cons? Yeah. Oh yeah. You lose one of those bitches, guess what? You got to buy two more of those bitches. Yep, because you can't buy a single Joy-Con. Got to buy them as no. a pair. You can't buy a single bitch. You could only buy a double bitch. <laughs> you got to buy your bitches in pairs. With you get two bitches or nothing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is <sighs> not surprising, um, but no, a little disappointing. At, at least the barrier to entry isn't high. 
it still sucks that there's a barrier to entry that in order to get cloud, in order to set, to protect your save data that you have to pay to do online cloud saves. Like yeah. the idea that you can't buy a memory card and put it into your switch and then move your, da your save data to the memory card is fucking outrageous. No. You like, can just transfer how is your that not a thing? Uh, they, they've got to make that a thing. They got to fix Nintendo. You got to fix it. I love you, Nintendo. We all love you. Please. They have a USB slot on the back. I don't know why you just can't make that compatible with, you know, putting your shit on Slide your Slide on into that USB port. I mean, you can't yeah, transfer your save data, but only one way. And then other, but yeah, you can't back your shit up. Back it up. You can't. Why? Why? Because you might cheat. And that would be the worst thing that would ever Who's possibly happen. Who's fucking cheating at Splatoon? Can I meet these people? <laughs> Can I? Yeah. Let's talk about yeah. this for a second. Oh my god. They're still goodness. bumbling around this online world. Um, it's okay, Nintendo. I got your back. Okay, let's see here. One final story. We'll try to make it a quick one. Oculus Connect is happening here in the Connect Bay Area. Five. Um if you guys are interested in virtual reality, uh they announced Oculus Quest, a standalone virtual reality headset that's launching in the spring of 2019. I've got a write-up from TheVerge.com. It'll be $399, and Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg says that with Oculus Quest, we will complete our first generation of Oculus products that it combines key attributes of the ideal VR system, a wireless design, virtual hand controllers, and full positional tracking. If we can bring these three qualities together in one product, we think that will be the foundation of a new generation of VR. He, of course, famously said that he wanted one billion people in virtual reality, which is a little laughable. <laughs> one billion dollars. Exactly. Sorry, I had to. He just wants us all living in the Ready Player One universe. Um, mm. No, thank you. That seems fucking miserable. <laughs> right? The Oculus Quest is a consumer version of what was previously known as Project Santa Cruz. It uses motion controllers similar to the Oculus Touch, has four wide-angle cameras to provide positional tracking that lets people walk through virtual space. It's supposed to support Rift quality experiences with a starting catalog of over 50 titles, including well-known existing games like Climbing Simulator, The Climb, and adventure puzzle game, Moss, which is Aww. a game that we all love very much. Um, Oculus VR head Hugo Barra describes the Oculus Quest as, quote, made for games, distinguishing it from Oculus's other more video-focused mobile headset, Oculus Go. We are going to invest significantly in this new platform, Barra said. Barra? Barra. Barra. Um, just so you guys know, I'm not going to go through all of the specs, but it is supposed to be a bridge between the more mobile focus Oculus Go and, of course, their traditional Oculus Rift headset, which is tethered to your PC. So I was looking around since this just got announced uh, to see if any of these tech sites had hands-on impressions, and I haven't seen any yet, but that's because Oculus Connect is happening right now. I'm hoping that by the end of the conference that we'll get some details on how this thing runs. Um, because obviously Oculus can say whatever they want about their product, but you got to yeah. see if it's got the goods. Because I am personally excited and interested by wireless VR, because that to me is the real drawback right now for why I don't play with my PSVR. And my Oculus Rift is in the closet, because <laughs> I'm just like having to set it all up and tear it all down because it takes so much space on my desk. I'm just like can't do it but if I could have like a, a nifty little case and all I had to do was put it on and sit in any chair in my house now we're talking yep that's what I, I'm all excited built-in audio wireless that is what I want um talking about the graphics because I also was trying to look up to see if anyone had any hands-on impressions I'm not going to know what any of this means it's a short paragraph but Oculus told Gizmodo that the Quest will have a Qualcomm Snapdragon 835 processor. That's more powerful than the 821 found in the Go and the same processor found in the Lenovo and Google's Daydream headset, as well as smartphones like the Samsung S8. Traditionally, it is not as capable of 3D rendering as the CPUs and GPUs found in the PCs that power the Oculus Rift. So, well, yeah, I, duh. <laughs> right. Well, because people were taking that quote that it's going to deliver Rift like experiences and said, oh, it's going to be as powerful as the Rift. And it's like, no, nah, dog, uh, it's not. No, not when it's sitting on your head. Right. I think that someone in the comments was speaking far too intelligently for me, but they were saying that this is about the equivalent as a low end requirement for 
Oculus for Rift on a PC. That makes sense. Makes sense. So like yeah. minimum requirements will be the maximum settings on this thing. Mm-hmm. Yes. That sounds yeah. right. I think yeah. that that works for a lot of uh, specific types of experiences in VR. Um, but obviously some of the more um, graphic heavy ones won't be able to run. It'll be interesting to see where the line is drawn. Right. This is one step forward, ladies and gentlemen. Pretty soon this all be wireless. It'll be epic. It'll be beautiful HD. Versus and I will off. still not care about it. Ah, <laughs> oh, Steimer. Bring in the salt as per usual. It's not salt. It's just I know what I want and what I don't. There's I'm nothing, not going to argue with that. nothing wrong with that. Um, and on that note, we're going to take our first break of the show. Oh, my gosh. Look at the time. Uh, you guys get up, go to the bathroom, pull over to the side of the road, wipe your brow, whatever you need to do. I thought you were going to say wipe your butt. Wipe like, butt. I also thought that. I was like, what is happening in this car? <laughs> You're sweating, you know? Are you it's okay? It's been an exciting first segment. You need to, like, dab your brow. Oh, my gosh. Did you really think I was going to say wipe your butt? I really well, yeah. did. I don't yeah. know why, but that's exactly where my head went. I know exactly that's where, where my head too. went there. I know you too. All right, everybody. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. This is segment two of the What's Good Games podcast, where we talk about what we've been playing and this week, it's brought to you by Stitch Fix. So you guys probably have heard me talk about Stitch Fix on this show and on Games Daily. I have been a fan of Stitch Fix for a while. Steimer, you've used Stitch Fix in the past as well, right? Or is this your no, first time this using the, it? this is the first time. Yeah, I was oh like, Oh my gosh, what? you're new to <laughs> Stitch Fix. Well, I'm super excited for you guys to be like Steimer and try them out. So if you haven't heard, they're an online personal styling service that finds and delivers clothes, shoes, and accessories to fit your body, budget, and your lifestyle. Signing up, of course, is super easy. You just go to stitchfix.com slash what's good to tell them your sizes, what styles you like, and how much you want to spend on each item. You're going to be paired with your very own personal stylist who will handpick five items and send them right to your door when they arrive then the fun part happens you try them on of course you'll pay for only what you love and return the rest for free and let me say that again shipping exchanges and returns are always free Brittany, you've Ugh. kept a couple of your recent pieces from stitch fix i did and i got a new one in yesterday and there are these really cute leggings in there and then a really cute shirt that i if i had seen on it at a store i would have walked right past it but because it was sent to me, I tried it on and I was like, oh my God, this is really effing cute. And like I was telling Steimer a couple weeks ago, my closet is nothing but video game tank tops and shirts and jeans. And I- I've seen it, I can attest. That's all it is, a big old room of nothing but t video game shirts. So I, I appreciate fashion, but I admittedly just don't have the patience or the time to try to learn like what what's a hip, what, what are the cool kids wearing these days? And Stitch Fix literally takes care of it for me. And I'm like, oh, I look like I'm with the times now. I really appreciate it. I can't wait for, like, new fashion forward, Brittany. I know. <laughs> you did look super cute at RTX and all of your dresses. I loved it. Yeah, um, yeah. And if you guys are interested in Stitch Fix, if this has you excited, like Brittany is excited, there's no subscription required, and you can sign up to receive your scheduled shipments or get your fix whenever you want. That's the way I do it. Uh, sometimes I'll get a couple fixes in one month. Sometimes I'll skip a month. But you can also do regular shipments if you want. Uh, and, of course, the Stitch Fix styling fee is only $20, which is applied towards anything that you keep from your shipment, which is the best part. And because you're fans of What's Good Games, we've got an awesome offer for you. If you head to stitchfix.com, that's S-T-I-T-C-H-F-I-X.com slash what's good, you'll get an extra 25% off when you keep all five items in your box. That's right, stitchfix.com slash what's good to get an extra 25% off, and it'll help you get started today. They also have a fantastic app. Make sure you sign up using our promo code, stitchfix.com slash what's good. I am definitely going to be wearing my new Stitch Fit sneakers. I'll post a photo on, on Instagram. You guys can see them. They're super cute. I love shoes. Me too. Shoes. Um, Steiner. I know you do. Girl, I've seen your closet. <laughs> Wait, my closet? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of shoes. Yeah. Still not as many shoes as my husband, though. He has a real yeah. shoe problem. That's crazy. Um, I know. His shoe problem was so crazy that he had to start keeping his shoes at his office so I wouldn't see how many he bought. <laughs> 
This is a true story. And his coworkers will back so me up. That's when you adorable. walk into John's office at PlayStation, there's a whole wall of just sneakers. <laughs> oh my mean, God. There was one time when I went with him to the office to pick up some stuff that he was going to give away on the free table. And I was like, no, let me take it and uh, I'll give it away to, to what's good people. And so we, I went with him to his office and I walked into his, walked in. I was like, holy shit, there are so many shoes here. And he was like, what? And I was like, where did all these shoes come from? <laughs> Wait, could you like build a box fort with it? That amount of shoes? Uh, we're talking like at least 40 pairs. Holy Ooh. fuck. Of sneakers. In his office. That's just not, not even in your house. That's his office. Yeah. So, well, he's got like a shoe rack for them. So they're not in the boxes. Like they're, they're like displayed um, on a rack. So whatever people come in, they can see his like fly ass sneaker collection. Oh my God. Okay, That's so, actually really funny. So does he wear like slippers to work and then he puts the shoes on there? Or does he have like a burner pair of shoes that he wears he's to He's got from? some slip on sneakers, um, some like casual sneaks that he mm -hmm. wears on the weekends and stuff. And sometimes okay. he does change his shoes when he gets to the office, depending on what meetings he has that day. <laughs> I love it. I love John Drake. <laughs> I know. He's the best. Um, let's get into what we've been talking about or what we've been playing this weekend. Steimer, you finally finished Tomb Raider. Yes, I did. Did you enjoy your time with it? I appreciated that it was not a massive game. It was just the right size for me, which uh, is okay. Yes, I knew. I know this pillow is coming. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, mine's over here. I got to get it out just in case. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, I think if I think if you were not a fan of the other Tomb Raiders, this will by no means change your mind. I think that's true. a fairly standard statement across the board from everybody so far. It is more Tomb Raider. Um, I wasn't super, like, won over by the quote-unquote new things that they'd added, like adding mud to you. I think you look cool. You look fucking rad covered in mud. <laughs> Stabbing dudes. Great. Love it. Um, but in terms of gameplay, I didn't think it added that much. Uh, and ah, I thought the story was well paced. It was actually interesting. I really liked Lara's arc, uh, for once, which is nice. <laughs> and I think it, it ended on a nice note. I really, I was pleased with it. I think if you've played either of the other two and you've enjoyed them at all, you should absolutely get this and see it through. I agree. I thought it was really fun. And if there wasn't so much happening or if I'd come out at a different time of the year I probably would revisit it and maybe consider doing new game plus because I really had a lot of fun playing it and like you said it was it felt like it was just the right length of time for to play you know like a like a solid like 20 to 25 hours depending on how much of the side content that you did and I finished the game at 75 percent completion but I know you can finish it with a little bit less um so I, think I, I was around six 60-ish? 60-ish? That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah, because there was a couple areas, particularly in like um, uh, the first, the name of the first city, which I can't remember. Cozumel? Karak. No. I'm not, mm, no. Mm. You're in Mexico the first time. No, 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 no. The first little open world area. Oh. No. oh. I can know people are yeah, listening right. to me going, oh my God, Andrea, it's just this. Um. Kawakiaku, that's what it is. Um, that... Why wouldn't she remember that name? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's weird. Um, there was a lot that I didn't do that I didn't do there because I just like went to, went through that one pyramid thing and then I kept going. Um, but I, re I really enjoyed it too. Did you guys see the news about the alternate ending that was accidentally included in the game that they patched out I... with the day one patch? I no. didn't read about it. Because um, I saw the headline, it hadn't finished the game yet, and went nope, and like immediately scrolled past. I was like, no, 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 no. And then once I beat the game, I was like, okay, now I need to go find and figure out what it was that was patched out of this. Yeah, so it technically wasn't an alternate ending for the game. It was an alternate scene that is the post credit scene. Um, so the one that's in the game is really kind of, kind of sweet and kind of puts a nice little button on the trilogy. Um, and gives a couple of nods to the original franchise, like the one from the 90s. But the alternate ending that was discovered because some people um, on Reset Era, I think it was, or maybe it was um, Reddit, discovered it because they never patched their game because where they live on this island, they have really bad internet. And so they just played the game without patching it. 
And when they got all the way to the end of the credits, they found the scene <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be there where ah, there's a letter works. from a character that's apparently um, a villain in the original series that would maybe set up some things to happen in the next game. And that's all I'll say about it in case you want to hunt it down to find the actual details you can. But um, it's interesting that they patched it out. So that either means that they are not going in that direction uh, with the future of the Tomb Raider franchise or they didn't want to give that much away. We'll never <laughs> know. Dun, dun, dun. Or they're like, we need a little breather here. Well, they definitely need a breather, right? And I think the sales of this game are probably going to indicate that they need a breather. Not that the game isn't good, like as we've said, no, it is. Yeah. you know, and a, a big thank you to Square Enix for sending us promotional copies of the game for us to play. But um, it, it's just so crowded right now with so many games that it's it's a tough landscape. And I totally forgot that Assassin's Creed was happening so close to the launch of that game. Um, not that they're like in any way, shape or form the same thing. I think someone on Twitter was like, oh, do you think Cassandra is better than Lara? And I was like. They're, they're why just, they're just different they're just different characters they're not even the same yeah what? like you don't have to be like is one better than the other can't you just like both por no los dos it's exactly. like someone once asked me what's better call of duty or zelda and i was like are you serious it's not even what you can't you can't do that's that. a kumquat and a banana a what are you talking quat. about uh, i just man. randomly thought of words and put them outside <laughs> of my body and the form of my mouth. Oh my God. From my mouth. I, I don't know what's you. happening. My keep, keep it going, Cyber. Keep it going. You're on a roll, baby girl. <laughs> <sighs> I'm excited oh, yeah. to start Tomb Raider. I'm still working on Spider-Man, but uh, I kind of had to set that down because I got Assassin's Creed, and then I also got Life is Strange 2, and I, 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 I am swimming in review codes. It's a good problem to have, but it's hard to prioritize. Like, what do I want to play first? It's well, the season. I would assume Life is Strange because it's short. Shorter, yeah. I should say, than the other games. Yeah, so yes. speaking of Life is Strange, Brittany, um, yeah. Life is Strange 2, Episode 1, launched this week. Um, of course, we partnered with Square Enix at PAX West to throw the Life is Strange 2 What's Good Game fan meetup. Thank you to them for you know, working with us to sponsor that event. And thank you to Square Enix for providing us promotional copies of Life is Strange 2, Episode 1. I... I'm saving this now I'm saving it because I was torn about talking about it on the show this week so I'm glad that at least one of us played it because part of me is like how do I talk about this without without just spoiling it out out, out the gate yeah um, it's and hard I, and I don't Please know don't. if I would be able to so I'm going to make you do it instead <laughs> thanks I got you just give it a thumbs up or a medium or a down I can, I can say a few things without spoiling this okay. Okay. Uh, so obviously what we already know about life is strange too is it follows two brothers on their quest to go to a new location because some shit has gone down and they need to flee the area they're going to you have the older brother the younger brother you have uh sean older brother daniel younger brother and it plays like a life is strange game i would say so far i've noticed that there's more openness to it it Runs better. It looks better, which is to be expected. Hell yeah. Runs Head. better. That's great news. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure how it would resonate with me because obviously in the first Life is Strange, you have Chloe and Max and, you know, they're teenage girls and they're in high school and every, well, most everyone's gone through high school. So you can kind of understand what they're going through. But what Daniel and Sean are going through is so out there that, I mean, it's out there for me. I'm sure some people can relate to certain experiences that they have. And also, there's a lot of trees in this game because it literally takes place in, like, my backyard. And I'm like, this is – how am I going to enjoy this game? I hate trees. You're like, I hate the trees. I hate the trees. Burn no. all the trees down. But, um, no, I, I really enjoyed the, the first episode. I I mean, it, it's a good it's a good package, a good overall introduction to, I think, the following episodes we're going to get. There were some oh, shit moments, which would be expected. And it's just – whenever you play a Life is Strange game, you just expect everything to go wrong. And oh, I yeah. found myself really, really protective over Daniel, the little brother. You know, he'd be like, I'm going to go run over here by the river. And I was chasing after him as you're a shot. Like, terrible no child, idea. No child, you're not. And, you know, just always keeping an eye on him. So, so far they've done a really great job at building that that um, connection between the brothers where you do feel very responsible. And like the developers have said, it is your duty to shape Daniel into what kind of – you're basically parenting him, right? So, oh, gosh. That's such a, like – 
It is so much responsibility. I, it's I, like in The Witcher with Siri if you fuck it up. I fucked that up so bad. That was I'll never forget. That was traumatic. Anyway, I found myself really you know, taking that parental role and I'm not a parent, but I felt like, okay, you can slide with this, but for this, I'm going to call you out on your bullshit. And it was really interesting how into it I really was, but yeah, I think you guys will really like it. Do you recommend it? Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. it. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really looking forward to it as well. Being on the panel with Christian divine, the lead writer, uh, you know, who's working with don't nod on this series, who also has worked on all of the, (laughs) Life is Strange games was really fascinating um, because he is clearly, I think, a little nervous about how people are going to react to these characters because the Life is Strange community gravitated so quickly and uh, so heavily towards Chloe and Max as, as characters in the original Life is Strange. And he was saying, you know, I just I hope that you trust that we're doing the right thing, that we're giving you amazing characters and amazing storylines because if you trusted us with the first game, you know, please just trust us with this one and, and go on this journey and you and we won't let you down. And I thought that that was, um, you know, like a really heartfelt thing for him to say and really him showing some vulnerability to say, you know, you know, we are we are worried that people aren't going to understand or like these characters and we have put a lot of work into them and we hope that you really love them. So have you. Have you, you know, kind of formed a premature or a initial, I should say, maybe uh, attachment to these characters yet, Britt? Do you think that you're going to that you're going to be interested in, in seeing where they go? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm definitely interested to see where they're going. Um, you know, like I said earlier, because they're not teenage girls, there isn't that super intimate level of connection that I immediately felt with Max when I played. But and the way Daniel and Sean live their life is vastly different than any way I ever lived my life. But I'm still, and so I can hear myself talking. It's throwing me out, throwing me off a little bit, but it's fine. Long story short, yes, very interested. I think they've set up a really interesting template for where this could go. And uh, I, like I said, I'm already protective over Daniel, that little shit. Better not go play <laughs> more rivers. Yeah, I, I can't say anymore without spoiling it. That's good. Yeah, no, I was always a big fan of the fact that they decided to leave Chloe and Max and that whole mm-hmm. story. And we're like, no, no, new chapter. Because honestly, if they had kept them, I probably wouldn't be that interested in this game. Like, I think that tale was done. You can fatigue out on characters, even if you love them and enjoy them. And so I am very much looking forward to spending time with, like, these new characters. And they are, like Brittany has said, obviously very different from anything I've ever lived. I've never been a young man. Nor will I ever be. Especially since I'm old now. But, um... (laughs) Um, you're not old. I'm, for the record. I'm curious to see the the dynamic. I'm curious to see whether or not me as salty face McGee oh will <laughs> enjoy the the younger brother element because you're asshole. I did. Uh, well, no, I'm nice sometimes. Asshole brother. It's always de- it depends on my mood. Um, but I, I like I, I will liken it to <laughs> how I felt about Atreus. In God of War, where like at first, there was definitely times I was like, I want to kick you in the head. Like you're just being real annoying. But then there were some times where I was like, Oh, come here. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. not that Kratos ever does that, but you know. Or I wanted to do head pat. <laughs> where's <laughs> Where's press uh, X to head pat? <laughs> Kratos Boy. secret move. Boy, Atreus is like pounded into the ground because Kratos is so goddamn strong. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I'm I'm interested to see where this tale goes. And I, unlike Brittany, fucking love trees. Trees are great. I like. Trees Can't too. wait to see these trees. They're ten nice out of trees. ten. They're they're great trees. It's just it's, too, it's fine. It's not trees give you oxygen to breathe. You should I enjoy know. the trees. I do, but not everywhere. Not in my real life. Not in video games. Not anyway. You should definitely like them in your real life. It's like I mean, the I one do. place where they should. I do, but there's no escapism because that's what I see every day. I look out like, hello, trees. I'm happy you're part of my real life. I do not need to see them in video games all the time. It's fine. Trees killed Horizon Zero Dawn for me. That's an exaggeration. Oh that my was God. a lie. I cannot I roll my eyes any game. harder at that. Get out of here. Do you know how many <laughs> trees are in Legend of Zelda? Please. Yeah, and I haven't finished it. <laughs> you never did the Ganon fight? 
No, just accidentally one time, and then I. Oh yeah, I remember had we had this conversation where you yeah. were like, I accidentally yeah. started fighting Ganon, and I was like, "That's not a thing. That's not a thing oh, that yeah. happens. Yeah. You can't accidentally fight Ganon in that oh, game. Oh yes, you can. No, you and very clearly see where the Gan. Okay, okay, we're not going back into this. <laughs> I Exploration do ask you, got the best of me that day. I do want to ask you, Brittany. This. Did you get your headphones fixed? Are they be are they better? My headphones. You said you were hearing yourself. Oh yes, yes. Oh, it's Okay, good. It's the thing that happens on Facebook Messenger to Brittany and I sometimes where it basically yeah. reverbs our voice back into our ears. And so it's essentially a speech jammer and it's really difficult to talk through, but we, we try. We do try. We try our best. Sometimes we'll talk like this a little bit and then it's like, okay, that's what's happening. We're just getting used to the sound of our voice in our ears. It's gotcha. when you, when either of us slow down our speech significantly, that is probably what is happening yeah. to us. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Um, so there's, um, a lot of things that I played at TGS, which we're going to talk about in the final segment of the show. But, um, I also, um, have been playing more Celeste I'm in the home stretch of that game, but I I have to do it in waves now because <laughs> it's so difficult. It, the final the final the final stage is so hard that in order for me to make it through and not completely lose my mind, I have to take breaks. <laughs> hey, um, your mental health above all else. Yep. Seriously. I mean, and like the final, the, the narrative stuff that happens in the final stage. And, you know, I talked about this at length over the last two episodes, so I'm not going to like deep dive back into it, but it's really, really amazing. Like the, the narrative work that's being done in that game. I really can't recommend it enough. Um, but, um, I've also been playing a lot more of, uh, Destiny 2. So I've been really excited to see that with the Forsaken launch that we are now, what three odd weeks out from launch that they continue to add content, which is awesome. And I know that they have a season pass pan, a uh, season pass plan in place. Um, and that that's going to add even more content in between, you know, the major content drops, but it's been, it's been really fun. Obviously I got into a little bit of a heated conversation with Destin from IGN's fire team chat. In fact, Ooh. I am going on fire team chat. So I believe that's posting tomorrow on Saturday. So if you guys are interested in hearing me, um, kind of rant and get into it with, uh, with those guys about destiny too, uh, please do check out IGN's fire team chat this week. But, um, it's been, <laughs> it's been fun. I would love to tell you my impressions on the raid, but I'm not strong enough to enter the raid yet <laughs> because the light level requirements of the raid are absolutely outrageous. Um, and I had a big back and forth with him about, you know, the idea of how raiding in MMOs is gated and the long tail of content and how, you know, raids are designed for only a small select group to be able to be world's first or to be able to compete. And Steimer, I was hoping that maybe you could provide me some insight as somebody who's played more in the PC space than I have. If you think that making certain types of end game content exclusive to only the hardest of hardcore dedicated players is something that is first common and duh, of course, only like a thousand people should be able to play it and be like what you think of that. Do you think that's good or bad? Here's what I will say. It is common for MMOs to have end game content like a raid that most people won't touch. However, those games also have significantly more other content to partake in than Destiny. So I think it's not really a complete apples to apples comparison because even if I jumped into Guild Wars right now, I could still go play something and I could play something at my level and how I could try a raid. My gear would suck. It would I would probably be really miserable doing it, but I could give it a go. I could enter it, I think. Unless they've, I don't know, actually, no, I haven't looked into it too much. But the gating there isn't as significant as Destiny can be. But I do think with Destiny, you tend to run out of things to do a lot more quickly than you would with an actual MMO. You can just, like, I could just dick around in Guild Wars if I wanted to. Or hell and wow, just be like, I'm picking flowers today and I'm selling them on the market. That's what I'm doing today. This is my gameplay experience. 
Uh, but with Destiny, you're like, either I'm running uh, a strike or one of the many other missions where you are literally just shooting things and then coming back and then shooting things and then coming back. So I think it's... I understand why they why they do it that way, but I do see your point of... you. It's harder to justify such a high gate when there isn't as much other th stuff to do. Like, hmm. give everybody more content instead of trying to lock it all behind prestige. Yeah, and I think that that was, you know, one of the reasons why I've been, you know, frustrated and why a lot of Destiny fans are frustrated not just with, you know, the launch of D2 and how there was a lot of features that we had hoped were going to be fixed for D2 from, from Destiny, but that it seems to me that so much of the long tail of this content isn't additional content. It's literally just replaying the same content with an artificial grind in place. So that, that instead of me being able to play the game for 50 hours and then access end game content, which seems like a reasonable amount of time to get to end game content, 50 hours is a lot of time to invest in a single game. Yep. Um, I'm sure like I might not be able to beat the end game content at my first go. I might have to practice and play it for several more hours before I'm able to you know, even make a dent. But the idea that I can't even enter, well, I mean, I can enter it, but I'll immediately die. But from the first mm -hmm. enemy that shoots me, no matter how low level that enemy is, Pew! because my armor isn't strong enough to protect me from, from them. Um, just seemed really frustrating to me and that's something that I'm still struggling with and I've been talking about it a lot with the clan mates the the what's good guardians and um they've been they've been so good about like trying to keep me positive and I really appreciate it they're like but you love destiny and I was like I do I do love destiny <laughs> as she cries I love it yeah. so much yeah, oh, yeah. No, I think it's frustrating because destiny likes to toe the line of we're an MMO we're not an MMO and to me, I'm like, you need to pick a lane. Pick a lane. What are you? If you want to go that route of gear grinding, like that level of gear grinding and that level of gatekeeping on your endgame content, you kind of need to flesh the other parts out a lot better to make up for it. Um, but if you don't want to do that, which is, again, another very valid design choice, you need to reconsider how you build out your endgame. And it can't just be... You are replaying the old content where you have already played a thousand times over and over again to hopefully get a drop of gear that will make you a little bit better so that one day, eventually, you can make it to this thing we made probably a year ago because that might be how long it takes you to get here. That's an exaggeration. It shouldn't it's take not, you that long. It's not an exaggeration, though, because I'm going to use an example that we, uh, this past weekend, when I got home from Tokyo and I was sleeping at all random hours of the day because of weird jet lag, um... I decided to play the raid, the Leviathan raid, which is what shipped with Destiny 2 when it launched last year. And so going in now, uh, my light level was like 518 or something like that. The light level for that raid is minimum 300 and the maximum drops you get are 380. So quite a gap between where I am now yeah. and to where Should've it was. been relatively easy. You would think... It would be. So we took three new people in the clan who had never done the raid. So here we are. That can be a from, problem, though. Coordination. From, well, that's that's the point I'm going to get to, is that we had three people in the raid Sorry. that were all super high level that easily could have, you know, like helped cheese the other three people through it, right? Because we could have soaked damage from the from the bosses and done most of the DPS work and all of that to kind of like get them through the actual execution part of the raid, which is always the most challenging part of the raid. No matter how powerful your guns are or your gear is, the greatest part about the raids, particularly in Destiny, because that's the experience I'm talking about, I can't speak to the way other raids are in other games, is that the way that they're designed really encourages you and kind of forces you to have to work together as a team. I'm not saying it's not possible to do them with less than six people. Of course, it's been shown that you can. But in its truest form, like the teamwork you use in doing these instances is so gratifying and so rewarding that you executed it is great. So this idea that there's this artificial gate because they want to make enemies more bullet spongy so it takes just more shots to kill them, you know, or they want to devalue the power of your guns, your gear, 
because they want to scale up because you've scaled up. So they've scaled up the enemies, but the rewards didn't drop. And so we went in there and it took us over seven. For no one? No. Well, for, no, because we're all now, we all were over 400 light because we're in the new expansion. So, and the enemy scaled. So you would think that we would be able to like one shot kill most of these enemies and that the hard part would still be kind of like the, the execution of, of it. And uh, if you guys have played the Leviathan raid and you are familiar with the gauntlet room, that room in particular took us almost three hours to do because when you're teaching new people that room, it just takes, sometimes it takes a while to get. Well, when you're teaching half your crew, I think that's another thing. Right. Well, it's of, like, of course, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of new people to have in a, in a high end <laughs> Yes. Content. Yes, I agree. But like my frustration came because I was not anticipating getting higher level drops from that raid, but I was anticipating being powerful. I anticipated going in, being powerful, but Feeling also good. not getting any rewards for it, right? Essentially getting something that I was going to dismantle for parts and mm -hmm. that I wasn't going to yes. get anything good because it was easy. But it wasn't easy, and I still got shitty rewards. And I was like, "Wait a minute." There's got to be a better way. Like you either got to make the rewards semi worthwhile or you got to like scale down the 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 upscaling huh. on the enemy difficulty. And it was just like and it led me back. The reason I bring this up is that it led me back to my main point about the brand new raid, The Last Wish, and how this idea that you have to be this incredibly high light level to succeed or you go in at a low light level and it takes you what 20 hours to beat the raid <laughs> and I get that like they were figuring in time where they had to discover the mechanics right sure. but, e but even now like the teams that are running it teams that are in our our clan that are like 550 or 560 haven't beat it because they just don't have the coordination it's like huh it's like it's it, it's infuriating that that either they dropped it they dropped the raid too early. They should have given people another couple of weeks to power up because you can only collect so much powerful gear per week based off the way that the drop system works in Destiny. Or they should have lowered the light level and then added a prestige level for people who want to play it on a higher difficulty setting. No, they're going to add a prestige level eventually, but we don't know when that is. Huh. So it's like, yep. here's this content. You can't do it. Sorry. Yeah. And again, that's... That is normal yeah. for for an actual MMO. Uh, and just here it feels a little odd because in it's my not opinion, like you one have reasons, all of reasons... Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's yeah. missing a lot of the other meat in the pie that would normally Ooh. Yeah, make and, it and I think that juicy and appealing. I agree with, you know, some of the some of the WG Guardians like saying there's so much more, there's so many more ways to do the grind than there was before. They've added daily bounties back in. They've added daily missions. They've added more ways to get powerful gear. They've basically given you more ways to complete the grind, which I appreciate. But the grind is essentially still the same. And unless you have people who have are willing to dedicate multiple hours on a daily basis, do the grind and then carry you through to help you do the grind then it's going to take you even that much longer. And I say this because when the, the main campaign uh, of Destiny ended, like with every expansion that's come with Destiny, it's not truly the end, even though the narrative end is done, the, like the cutscenes are supposedly done. You go and then do patrols and, and, and do other missions and other things that, you know, kind of extend the length of the, the new lore in the, in the, in the um, expansion. But I couldn't go directly from the end of the campaign into this new area because I had to grind out this specific quest to unlock a key that then opened the new area. And then when I got there, I just died all the time because all the enemies were so high level, but I was never gifted any gear in order to make me strong enough to even do the basic missions in that area. So then I had to leave the brand new area, which just opened. And I'm like, oh my God, I finally made it to the Dreaming City. This is so exciting. And then Welcome I was like, I literally couldn't do any of the missions there. I, I picked them up and all of the enemies had the question mark, which meant that I was, and then when I would shoot them, they which would be immune, which meant that I was too low level to do any damage. And I was like, well, this fucking sucks. So I left the Dreaming City and went back to the other areas of Destiny that I've already been playing and had to replay all of that content again in order to, huh. to I mean, at, at least it's appropriately named. <laughs> 
<laughs> like you just true. <laughs> about it. Who only access this area in your dreams. Huh. <laughs> has uh, has Destiny had this problem in the past? Yes. It sounds like it's just really oh, okay. Yes, There's nothing new. <sighs> that sucks. I was I was bummed, but the upside, because I don't want this to sound like a crazy rant, because I am enjoying my time with the game. <laughs> Desp- I know, I know it's funny, right, Brittany? It's funny because I, I, again, I want to start a drama about you and Destiny. I feel like it'd be the best romantic drama comedy ever. Dude. It's, I, you, would, you guys would break up like every week, but then get back together immediately. It's We're like, like a a Nintendo opera. girl. I get it. I, I get the love and I get the frustration. I know. I just, <laughs> I just, I don't want, I, I don't want to have to spend so much time grinding in that game. In okay, order this to is be what able- we're going to do. Okay. Every week, I'm going to ask you about how you're feeling with Destiny. So right now, this week, 1 to 10, 10 being like, absolutely... Are you doing a mood chart? <laughs> yes, 1 to 10, 10 being absolutely enthralled, 1 being like, I fucking hate everything. What would you say your feelings toward Destiny 2 are right now? A 7. Okay. Noted. This is going to be great. I'm very excited Except about this. Except we won't talk to her for two more weeks. <laughs> I know. Well, when we come back, we'll, we'll ask her again. I don't think I'm bringing a console on this trip, though. No, you shouldn't. But so it'll probably be like a nine when you get that. But dude, that Assassin's like Creed draw is real. It's so right, good. Girl. It's so good. <laughs> um, I do want to end just one final note, and I'm going to keep it short. I do really love what they've done with the lore in this expansion. It's much needed and long overdue. And they're doing really cool things. And I want to thank the, the, the Guardians, the Westwood Guardians, for, for taking me through so much of this content. I just did the offering at the Oracle Engine and the cutscene that happens when you do that. I'm not going to say anything about because I don't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't done it yet. But um, there are payoffs. There are lore payoffs. And I do look forward to one day doing the Dreaming City Raid, The Last Wish eventually someday like three months from now <laughs> i don't know when <laughs> whenever i can get high enough level to not die every two months get grinding okay um and with that <laughs> do you want to uh, do you want to um pick up one of these dear wgg questions or do you want to talk about one of these other fifty thousand games you're playing Brittany? i, I can talk well, there I go again. In my ear. The world is so strange. Um, I'll talk about one of the 50 games I'm playing. Perfect. I don't... Which one? Which one? Let's see. I have Little Dragon's Cafe. Now. Sounds adorable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's created by Yasuhiro Wada, who made... I tried to pronounce it, and it was not good. Was Yasuhiro good Wada... Yeah, those are weird, like, English accent thrown in there. I don't know what happened. Anyway, he is the creator of Rune Factory and Harvest Moon. And he... <gasps> I and he made a game alongside. called Little Dragon's Cafe? Yes. Yes, he's a is god of the Switch. Switch? Timer. Yes. Yes. <gasps> <gasps> yeah, I can't, However, believe, you no hear, more. I can't believe you didn't hear about this game. It's, like, totally right up your alley. Yeah, so... Here, okay, so I love Harvest Moon. I'm just... I loved Harvest Moon. Now I love Story of Seasons. Harvest Moon can go die in a fire. It needs to actually go die in a fire. <gasps> oh no! Oh my God! This shit is so cute. It's it's really cute. So the idea, the whole gameplay loop is that you have to venture off into the world and collect ingredients and find recipes, and come back to your cafe and you have staff that help you and you create um you create you cook food and you can use that to Feed your dragon. So the dragon. The dragon comes into play. Turns out your mom's half dragon or something like that. I don't know. It's weird. Why not? Yeah. One day she's hunky-dory. The next day you and your twin, you can play as the boy or the girl. They're twins. They're like, hey, mom, how are you? She's like, I'm not feeling too good, but I love you. All right. See you in the next morning. She's in a coma because she's apparently half dragon. It's weird stuff. So she's like the original dragonborn? (laughs) Haha. Absolutely. 100%. You nailed it. And so then a, a dragon egg comes, and you are told that if you raise this dragon, it will save your mother. And then this, the game okay. just kind of goes from there. So I, I'm hesitating because it's really cute. I've spent maybe 10 hours or so with it. But it's it's so sh- – the, the gameplay is pretty shallow compared to a Story of Seasons game. And not only that, it just doesn't run very well on the Switch. Aww. I mean – the frame rate is pretty slow. It's 
but the dragon's really cute. The frame rate is slow. The controls are pretty slippery, and they're not. The controls are so unpolished that you are actually punished for it in certain. There are these enemies called Zuki's, Z-U-C-C-H-I's, and they're like beasts with chicken bones sticking out of the back of them. I don't know. It's weird. But okay. your, your, <laughs> your dragon has to hunt them in order for you to get the meats so you can cook with it. The problem is in order to hunt these animals, you have to be right next to them, and then you have to whistle. The whistling animation takes about a second, but by that point, the enemies are on you, and when they touch you, you lose any and all cooking dishes you have in your inventory. Hmm. And there's literally hardly any way around that. So it's not the most polished game, and I would say I'd only recommend it if you were into that sort of relaxing, chill gameplay loop that you would get from a Story of Seasons or a Harvest But is it relaxing and chill if you are losing your shit when you're trying to get the food necessary for a young Master Dragon? <laughs> young Master Dragon? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely it takes away from it, but if you play this game as more... If you play it with the idea that you're going to just have a chill time with it and sometimes it'll be something frustrating rather than have a critical eye when you play it, it's that kind of game where you have to try to turn the critical eye off and just enjoy it for the experience that it's giving you. But gotcha. again, it's super happy. There, as you play the game, you have new characters that come to your cafe, and you have to cook recipes for them in order for them to fill their story meter. And once they fill their story meter, they leave, and that's how you progress through the game. New areas unlock. You have to find these recipes that are in boxes scattered throughout the world. Every day, ingredients spawn on plants or maybe fish. You have a little garden that just grows on its own. So it's definitely a management sim. It's and I and I liked it. But I think after 10 hours, I'm like, all right, maybe I'm, I'm done. Just because it's, yeah, it's, it's a good first step. I think that there have been talks about more in the future. And I think if he takes this and then builds off of it, there could be something very fun there. So I should wait for Dra Little Dragon's Cafe 2. Yeah, Little Dragon's Buffet or Little Dragon's Schmorgasborg. Or just Dragon's Cafe. Yeah, because he didn't give me Little You're after that. You're going to lose the Little. He's not Little. Yeah. Yeah, Big Dragon. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's what I have to say about that. Cool. It's very cool. Anyone? Do you want me to take the next one? Again? Um, yeah, because well, well I've we played nothing else, so we I've can got talk nothing to talk very about very briefly anyway. about Assassin's Creed Odyssey. So, um, technically, the embargo for this game is not officially up. The review embargo is next week, right before launch. And I don't know if I can say the specific time of when it is, so I'll just be vague about it, but it's not today. <laughs> and there was a streaming embargo that lifted. So you may have seen some of your favorite streamers or some video game outlets streaming Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And so as we mentioned at the top of the show, it's been, or maybe we talked about it before we started recording. It's kind of confusing as to like what we can and can't talk about. Um, but I'm going to look up the, the restrictions again, just, just to be sure. Um, but I can say, hot damn, I'm having a fantastic time in this game. Yeah, I'm so excited to start it up. Maybe I'll do that tonight. Yeah, it's strange because the streaming, emb streaming embargo, I think, is the 27th? It was today, it, the 26th. It was today, 26th. And so what's tricky about, and we, we oftentimes get lots of interesting review guides. This is what we want you to talk about. This is what you can't talk about. These odd restrictions. And it's hard because if you are streaming a game, there's a high likelihood that you're going to talk about how that game makes you feel and what you like about the game or maybe what's a little frustrating just as you're casually playing it. And then the tricky part comes in, are you technically reviewing it right now or are these just early impressions? But it's not even like, because the, the wording was hands-on impressions or reviews. But then it says the review in progress streaming embargo is Wednesday the 26th. Who knows? It's, it's this is not why, clear. That's why I stay far, far away from this one. <laughs> I'm too nervous. I'm going to ruin something yeah, or scream something. And it's, it's just not even worth it. Yeah. <laughs> we will talk about it later. I'll play it from the safety and security of my house where no one can watch. Except for my husband. Um, well, and I'm your dog. Gonna be, but I'm going to be gone and I want to talk about it. Well, you have to wait just so we don't get blacklisted. <laughs> you can record us a little segment from Italy and I'll insert it in. Okay. Oh, yeah. You could record a little thing before you go and then we could insert wait. it in. Yeah later okay um here's what i'll say i'll say one thing um because i i had been tweeting with some people um about this because i posted a screenshot uh, of cassandra on 
her ship because of course i chose cassandra um Duh. and there was a squad because squad skins are back which you may remember from previous assassin's creed games and so i made all of the crew on my ship female assassins and Ooh. so what the cool part was is that when they started singing shanties are back bt dubs um they all started singing in female harmony so it was all female voices with my all female crew and that was like when that moment happened i was like like the heavens opening i felt like such a badass being this like total like xena warrior princess type character um like on my crew or on my deck of my ship with all of my like badass crewmates and they're all Mm -hmm. like singing this like rousing greek song and i'm just like this is (laughs) this is see that's so cool and it you know, I think this is what, something that's so great about our podcast is that we do provide the perspective as, you know, if you are a male gamer, you might not think that this is such a big deal or like, so what? But for us, when that little moment happens, I mean, I almost expect you to say that male voices came out of the female crew skins or whatever. That's what I hell. thought yeah. was going to happen. I just thought that yeah. it was a cosmetic skin. Yeah, it's just a cosmetic thing. But when they actually put in the female voices, it's like, oh my God, that is still so cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it was really great. And it it takes all of the things I loved about origins improves upon them and then adds things. And I will say, if you guys start to play this when I'm gone, not just you two ladies, but people listening and watching know that your choices will have consequences. Things that happen in side quests will have consequences in ways that you don't anticipate. And I had to find that out the hard way. And I also failed quests for the first time in this game, which I didn't know you could do, but I did it. So be careful about which quest you accept <laughs> when you accept them because you can fail stuff and you feel bad about it. And then you're like, but wait, I want to go back. And they do have a quick save system. So if you want to cheese it with the saves, you probably could. But I didn't. I was just like, well, that's just the way the cookie crumbles. Were you, were you mean to people, Andrea, and you thought there'd be no, no consequences? For I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was making the right call, doing something for someone, being vague here. And it turned out it wasn't the right call. And it screwed it up. <laughs> Aww. And I feel bad now. I don't know how to fix it. Because it was a long time ago and I can't go back to that save. I would lose a ton of progress. (laughs) I'm like, god damn it. This has never happened to me in Assassin's Creed before. (laughs) Um, So I'm I'm excited for you guys to, to, to play. Obviously, like I spoke ad nauseum about Origins last year and how much I loved it. And I'm going to be honest. I was, I was going into odyssey pretty blind i did not get a chance to play it um at e3 earlier this year which bummed me out but i knew that i would like it but i didn't really know much about the story and so far like it's really just hitting all the right notes so thank you to ubisoft for sending us the promotional code for assassin's creed odyssey i can't wait to sink dozens and dozens more hours into this game i'm ready my body is ready her body is ready her body is ready. We'll definitely okay. be talking more about this, and we might have to do a spoiler cast on this at some point. Yeah. Because there's lots of stuff to talk about. Yeah. Now, Steimer, hmm. real talk me, baby girl. Do you think you'll get around to playing Broken Sword 5 on your Switch? Because if so, I'll wait to talk about it next week when it's the Britain Steimer show. I'm not sure um, because she has to play Valkyria Chronicles 4. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, honestly, I'd rather obviously play Broken Sword. Because it's more more my jam. Okay. We could technically but, play both, I guess. I mean, okay. I know. In what universe do I have all this time? Where are you pulling? This? Do I have okay. a time turner now? I wish, right? <laughs> okay. Do you think you could maybe spend like a couple hours with it? Because I'd really like to talk to you with you about yes, this one. Yes, I could play okay. a couple hours of it. I okay, we'll punch this until next week then. Okay. Okay. Cool. On that note, let's take another quick break. And we, when we come back, if there's anything else, Britt, that you want to touch on, you'll let me know. But we've got Tokyo Game Show to recap for you guys. And um, we have, I think, uh, another WGG question. Stick with us, ladies and gentlemen. We will be right back. Welcome back, everybody. It's the final segment of the What's Good Games podcast, where we are talking about Tokyo Game Show 2018. Yes, I was in Japan. I went to the Makahari Messe. I think I said that right. 
the convention center where Tokyo Game Show happens every year. And man, it was a unique, interesting experience. And I'm so glad that I was able to go. Uh, Brandon Gann uh, wrote into WGG and says, hello, what's good? PlayStation is in a curious spot, and I was hoping to know your take on where we stand in regards to the recent announcement and lack thereof. Now that we're on the other side of TGS, oh, this is not the question I thought it was. Uh oh. Um, but now that I'm in it, we're just going to answer it, and then we're going to move on. <laughs> uh, do you think PlayStation had a great outing at the show? And what are your takes on surrounding the various details of the PlayStation Classic, which was announced, uh, like not knowing the full library, the price point, etc.? So this is a piece of news that we missed last week, since Simon and I recorded a special episode. Um, if you didn't hear, the PlayStation Classic is, of course, their mini PlayStation 1, uh, complete with DualShock controllers and 20 classic PlayStation titles. They, of course, have not revealed the full list of games, which to me is kind of a head-scratcher. Why wouldn't you not just list them all? Um, but maybe that means they're still adding titles? I don't know. It, of course, will be Probably still at, locking down contracts. That might be. It's uh, $99.99, correct? No idea. PlayStation. I was like, I literally saw it on Twitter. It was like, oh, that's cute. Won't pre order. Yes, it's ninety nine ninety nine. Okay. Sorry, um, I, was, I was looking up details on something that is irrelevant. So I was actually wine tasting in Italy. No, no, no. Santorini. Ooh, when la di da. I, when I happened to open up Jason's Twitter, because my Twitter's on his Twitter account. How many forest floor flavors did you experience on that wine taste? I don't know, but all that wine kind of sucked, if I'm just going to be honest. Oh. Greek it wine just... is not really, like, the hotness right now. Oh, really? Yeah. No, that's good. To... I don't know. They it... There was a cat there, and that was kind of a highlight of the of the day. <laughs> it was pretty cool. There's a lot of cats in Europe. Um, <laughs> and I, I opened up Twitter, and I was like, oh, my God. I was like, is this real? And at first, I was... Extremely excited as as I do as Brit. I you know I Britify things and I'm still excited about it. But then the critic in me is like, okay, I have about ten copies of all of these games across all of my PlayStation platforms right now. Do I really need this? And the answer is yes, I do, because uh, it's PlayStation One. It's like one of my favorite consoles ever, and it does have some great games on it that we know of. But I mean, I, I would say I'm more excited. I was more excited about the SNES Classic than the PlayStation Classic. I think those games just translate better. And I was talking about this with somebody on social media as well, that those kind of like side-scrolling or 2D pixel games just, you know, hold up better today than these kind of more polygonal games that just don't, they just don't look the same. And it's it's frustrating that, you know, we can't go back in time and look at these games that were so iconic for their era and go, yeah, it totally aged well, because most of them have not. No. No, I'm but excited, yeah. though. I mean, I think that's that's one of the hard parts. When I just hopped into Final Fantasy VII not that long ago, uh, you know, the game looks like shit, but I was able to look past that because I grew up with those graphics. But people who haven't, they're probably like, what is this blocky-ass, cloud-looking, weird mother effer? What is happening? Can't yeah, play this game. just wait for the remake that's never coming. Yeah. Oh, just kidding. It'll come in like 2021 when, the, you know, the next PlayStation, when PlayStation 5 launches, it'll be like, yeah, uh -huh. Final Fantasy 7 remake. Um, <laughs> um, where we uh, did PlayStation have a great outing at the show. So the PlayStation booth was fantastic. They did a giant esports presentation and they had some panels um, as far as like the games, they didn't have any new demos there. Um, they were re-showing the Kingdom Hearts 3 demo that we saw at E3. They had uh, a motorcycle from Days Gone that you could take a photo with, but the game was not there. Uh, they had Sekiro, uh, which we saw. They had new gameplay, but like that's not a PlayStation exclusive game. I know it's coming to other platforms, um, but it was in the PlayStation booth um, at, at TGS. They had the weird statue of Norman Reedus' character from Death Stranding that I took a photo with that he's holding like the little baby in the tube thing. Oh boy. Uh, so that was kind of oh fun. God. They had a lot of PlayStation VR games that were playable on the show floor. So they had a they had a definite like impressive booth uh, display on the show floor, but I mean, it's not like they were bringing the goods on a bunch of new games. Now, Bandai Namco on the other hand, had a ton of games that they were showcasing and giving some hands-on uh, with. So I had the honor of being invited by Bandai Namco to visit their Japanese headquarters 
in Tokyo, which was super cool. And I got to get uh, some hands on time and I watched some presentations on some games. Let me pull up my notes actually. So, um, oh no, these are wrong notes. Oh, I have it in Google Docs. Hold on one second. She's got the wrong notes. I do. I do. Boop, I do. Boo. Burr, 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 burr. Recent. Sing. Here we are. Uh, preview event. Okay, so Ace Combat 7 Skies Unknown. So I haven't played an Ace Combat game in... I don't even remember when. It's been a hot minute. It's been 85 years. Yeah. So they were talking... <laughs> 85 years, precisely. Uh, they were talking a lot about the VR mode. So this is something that's really cool and really exciting to people who are into virtual reality gaming because isn't this kind of like the, the, the dream game for VR? Like the idea that you're in a cockpit flying a fighter jet, right? Um, to me, I was watching the footage. That made my stomach turn just literally, thinking about literally, it. Literally, I yep. almost threw up just watching the footage. I didn't even put the headset on. I was like, nope. Oh, no. no nope. Don't, don't want to. It's hard enough for me to fly those combat sequences in the air just on 2D, like when I'm just playing it <laughs> on a regular game. <laughs> so it was not meant for me personally, but I did lear uh, learn a lot about it. So... The, the VR mode is exclusively for uh, PSVR, by the way. And they said it may foretell future possibilities for Ace Combat franchise in the flight combat genre, whatever that cryptic phrase means. Um, <laughs> they're going to have three uh, VR exclusive missions in the PS4 copy of the game. It's going to have a VR hangar where you can walk around life-size fighter aircraft and kind of see them up close as if they were, you know, like how big they are in real life, which is kind of an interesting idea. They're also going to have a VR air show that you can watch at any time where you'll be aboard an aircraft carrier and you can like watch an air show um, in virtual reality. Yeah, like the Blue Angels or something? Yeah, and it's, um, it's fully voiced commentary from the commander of the carrier, but I don't think it's going to be like FMV. I think it's going to be like all animated air shows. Um, huh. so it's a it, interesting, uh, a mode to include in this game. And then they also have a VR cockpit, which they've designed to look like the real thing. So when you're sitting inside the cockpit, it, it's a replica of what is in these actual aircraft. And they say, quote, tension of combat will be felt on a visceral level, meaning mm. smoke and fire will appear in the comp in the cockpit if you're getting attacked by enemy aircraft. Um, and there will be four levels of dis difficulty from easy to ace plus a free flight mode if you just want to fly around and not have to fight anybody. Um, but I played uh, just with the regular controller and it was fun. It feels really good. The aircraft looked good. And so if you're pumped for ace combat, like I, I enjoyed my time. It's just not my style of game, but everything I played looks really looked really beautiful. Um, they also uh, showed off some Jump Force, which of course is their fighting game that they announced at the Xbox stage back at E3 with a lot of manga characters that I have no idea who they are. <laughs> it was so funny. I was sitting, I was uh, thankfully friend of the show, Kimberly Wallace from Game Informer was at this press event oh, with me. Oh, she was there with you? Yeah. I was like, Thank Kim, God. help me. <laughs> She's like, don't worry, stick with me, kid. Um, <laughs> and so we're sitting, we're sitting together in the Jump Force presentation, and the gentleman who was giving the presentation had a, a European accent that I couldn't place, and he so he was saying the names of all these characters, and I was just like, I just could not understand what they were, and I don't think it's because it was his fault. I think it's because even if he said them in perfect like American <laughs> accent English, I would not have understood what, he, what they were. Um, oh my God. But um, of course, so Jump Fair. Force is One Piece. Um, oh my God. What are the other two mangas that are in Jump Force? It's one Dragon Ball. I can Google it. Yeah, Dr Dragon Ball and there's one more. Oh my God, Jump Force uh, manga. Dude, dude. Oh, it's not Death Note, is it? I don't think so. Dragon Ball, One Piece, and Naruto. There it is, Naruto. Naruto. Yeah. Um, so those three. Sorry, and many more. It says, but yeah. So those are like the three pillar. The three. So the three pillar characters from each of those manga are they announced on the um, for the collector's edition on this statue, um, and then of co they of course play a key role in the narrative. But they have so many cool characters. Plus, they talked about the original characters for the game. So they have Glover, Navigator, Galena, and Kane that are going to all have a key role in the story mode. So these are original characters specifically for Jump Force. 
Um, Glover is the leader of Jump Force. Galena and Kane are uh, villains in the story, and um, they didn't really give too many details about Navigator, but... Um, it was really um, it was really cool that they sh showed off some some of the gameplay. The game looks great. Um, I just have no idea what's happening from a narrative perspective. I'm just not even <laughs> going to pretend. You guys know, uh, you guys know this, but um, I uh, I think that this is clearly making a lot of Japanese manga fans very happy. Um, Did you else? see Trunks' brief? Trunks' briefs. The, pur the purple haired wonder. She's like, yeah, I totally saw him. She's like, I don't know who that is. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. There's definitely somebody with purple hair. I don't know. <sighs> that's my, um, that's my husband. My husband. Yeah. <laughs> um, God Eater 3 was a game I was not anticipating getting to see at TGS, but it was there. So um, if you guys aren't familiar with the God Eater franchise, it's very much like a Monster Hunter clone, like in every way, shape and form. This is basically like Ben and Namco looking at what Capcom was doing and going, we need that. <laughs> and so they made God Eater. Um, <clears throat> it started out on the PSP, I believe, and then was on PlayStation Vita. And so this is the first in the franchise that's being released only on console. So it's coming to PlayStation 4. And it was really interesting because somebody in our group Q&A asked the development team, you know, why didn't you decide to come to like Nintendo Switch or go handheld when this is clearly like a franchise with a legacy in handheld devices? And they just danced around the answer to that question. And he was and he kept being like, what? You're not answering my question. <laughs> oh, and, and I think what it came down to was what they wanted to do with the game wasn't possible with Nintendo Switch. And so that's why it's coming to PlayStation 4. And that obviously Sony has announced the end of the Vita life cycle, so they can't release it on Vita realistically. Uh, and so that's, uh, uh. That, and that's where it's at. And I think they also wanted to really kind of put a, a fresh coat of paint on this franchise and do some things a, a, a little bit differently. And um, there's a studio. Yes. Marvelous. So they're doing joint development of this game with Marvelous, who is helping to uh, renovate the game engine to improve the graphics after, of course, the graphical improvement was requested by fans. So can confirm graphics look good. And um, if you guys are interested, of course, there's, I believe, some new a new trailer that was released specifically for TGS that you guys can check out. But it looks nice. Imagine Monster Hunter, but with more narrative. And I know that some people are really into that. And some people are like, nah, dog, I just want to like go kill stuff. <laughs> I don't want to like hassle with storylines or quests or anything like that that aren't related to hunting monsters. And that's, I think, where Monster Hunter really found its niche. And that's what God Eater fans like is that it's more narrative heavy. And there certainly is a lot more happening from that perspective um, this time around as well. So, are you going to give it a shot since you like Monster Hunter so much? Um, You know? I'm not sure. I definitely was more intrigued going into this demo than I would have been if I hadn't spent 75 hours with Monster Hunter World earlier this year. Um, I probably wouldn't have even like given it a second thought, but I was watching the demo and hearing them talk about all of the new stuff that you have, like the free, the, the how you can run around uh, the characters and how they have the new burst starts actions and all of these new devouring attacks and these different things you can do. And I, I might give it a go. The getting into the narrative, uh, the third installment might be tough in a game that's focusing more on narrative than on combat. It was easy to get into Monster Hunter from a narrative perspective because it was literally just like, you're on this ship. You're going to this <laughs> island to kill this big monster. And that's it. You killed it. Good job. <laughs> like Monster Your Hunter job in 10 is seconds. to kill monsters in Monster Hunter. <laughs> yeah. You can't get more literal than that. Yeah, exactly exactly um so i'm not sure um we're gonna put a, a, a big maybe on that one, <laughs> on that one Brittany. Noted. um they did also show some more stuff from one piece world seeker which of course is the new one piece game there will there'll be two factions pro navy and anti-navy uh there are going to be game original characters brand new for this game that were created by one piece creator Oda-san, uh, that's uh, Jean, the leader of the anti-Navy group, the new female character, and then Isaac, the warden of the prison island, this new location for One Piece World Seeker. 
So they wanted a fresh experience um, for experienced manga game players, not just a simple good versus evil concept game. And they have pushed the release date for One Piece World Seeker out to 2019 after feedback from a recent showing of the game because they clearly were like, hey, we got more work to do. So they've delayed the release of that game. Um, yeah, so I think that's most of the news from everything that I talked about. Um, I do want to say I got to play Earth Defense Force 5. I haven't played an Earth Defense Force game in a hot minute. Have you either of you played anything from the Earth Defense Force franchise? I haven't, but I've been watching trailers and stuff for this game. It looks bonkers in a good way. Stimer, you ever dipped your toes in EDF? I definitely watched Brudvig review one once, but I don't remember if I played with him or not. Yeah. It, it, basically, in a nutshell, it's just you shooting giant bugs. So. Yeah, I knew, <laughs> yeah, I know the giant bug concept. Yeah, so it's, um, I mean... EDF 5 and EDF Iron Rain, which is the 2019 release, um, and EDF 5 is coming out sometime later this year. I mean, that's what they are. They're just shooting giant bugs, but the guns feel great. Uh, the graphics in Iron Rain in particular look really awesome. It definitely needed a, a graphical overhaul, <laughs> for sure. But I mean, it, it's just fun. That game, I think, really leaned in to the almost like B movie, like the, the kind of factor, the Sharknado factor, this idea mm -hmm. that it's just so ridiculous that let's just run with it. And their fan base has really loved it. And I'm glad though, that instead of just kind of, you know, resting on their laurels, they're like, Hey, if we're gonna do this, let's do it. You know, like, let's make it look good. Let's make it play good. Let's not make it janky, you know, because <laughs> some of those old games, man, they were rough. But yeah. <laughs> Be movie in spirit, not in controls and mechanics. Right. So what I played was super fun, and I I had not anticipating putting Earth Defense Force Iron Rain on my to do list in 2019, but it's there now. So it's fucking awesome. I am. But I love Katamari, so please tell me what you played. Yeah. So I had never played Katamari before. Katamari Damacy. And if you guys aren't familiar, like I wasn't, it's a puzzle game where you roll around this ball and the ball just picks up items, like a sticky ball, and you just keep picking up items. And the you whole have to accrue mass. Right. The idea it's is to get to a certain diameter of junk. <laughs> and you a certain pick, amount of time. You pick up junk in order of its size, and that's part of... Yes. <laughs> Not that kind of junk. Uh, no, she meant diameter in a certain amount of time. Oh, right? No? And junk. Yeah. And junk. All there of it. It was just great. It was a lot of entendre perfect. there. Um, and obviously that's the puzzle element of the game. And <laughs> I picked it up to play it on Nintendo Switch because they were Katamari uh, re-roll is what they were showing. And I had no idea what I was doing. And John just came roll around. Up. John came over and helped me, not uh, not my John, Kim's John. And he, I was like, am I doing am I doing something wrong here? And Probably. he was like, the controls for Katamari are notoriously a little difficult. So I was like, okay, well, you play it and I'll watch. And so I watched it and he just like breezed right through the level. And I was <laughs> like, what the fuck am I doing wrong? It's just rolling around a giant ball. Uh, it's, it's rolling around a giant ball, but you have to like collect the smaller objects so that your ball can pick up the bigger objects you have to like do it in a certain yes a pattern to that a, a part pattern. i understood because right. donut county is essentially just reverse katamari and so i was yes. like okay i can i can get that i can get into this i was just having trouble because i didn't realize that you have to hold the sticks in opposite directions um and i was pushing the mm. sticks in the same direction and that was my character was like nope that's that's not how you do this <laughs> and so once i figured it out i was like uh Okay, I got it. It looks good. I mean, it's Katamari on Nintendo Switch. It's going to be perfect. Hell yeah. You know, like it looked great. It, it felt great. Once I figured out how to play, which is not on the game's fault. That's completely a user error. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I, I think that game's going to be awesome. I actually don't know the release date for that game. Let me look it up. She's looking up the release date. Yeah, she is. The Katamari Damacy Arrivo. Oh, is that it, Damacy? I know I was saying that wrong. I don't know how to say it. Still looking up, but the date. it's still 
and your dad's really mean to you in that game, and he yells at you and tells you you're no good, and it makes you feel bad inside. Is that why you roll around collecting mass? Yeah. I'm so upset. I'm going to turn into a ball of gravity. No, and he like, to... he's like, you need to do this thing. And then you do the thing, and he's like, you fucking suck. And you're like, wow. but dad, dad, of the but year dad I love you. And he's like, it doesn't matter. Go Get roll out. around oh, more. It, it looks like some, a bigger people, ball. some people are not are not happy that they didn't update the, the controls. Uh, I mean, I can see that. If you're gonna if you're gonna re-release it, like put a little polish on it, put a little effort in. Yeah, it looks like the release date, according to GameStop, is December seventh. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah, it's coming very soon. <laughs> I thought you were making fun of me. I was like, "Geez, all right, it's spicy, Brittany." <laughs> oh no! Oh no, Samer. Um, so thank oh. you to Bandai uh, for for having me out and showing me a bunch of your games. Um, but I hate to do this to you, Bandai, but the star of everything I played at TGS was Devil May Cry 5 from Capcom. And I was not anticipating that going into this demo because I made the Capcom demo to play Resident Evil 2 because they had a brand new demo, which I mentioned I can't talk about yet. Um, or maybe I didn't mention that. Maybe I mentioned that on you the pre-show. mentioned pre -show. That on the pre-show, Patreon pre-show. Um, but uh, so the embargo for that's not up yet, but I will talk about it soon because I know Britt wants every drop of information she can get. Every drop. But Devil May Cry 5. Um, obviously, this game has been, we've known about this game for a little bit now, and they showed off some new trailers. And the, the difference really this time is we've got three playable characters. Now, they didn't really show any of V, this third playable character, but I did get to play as both Nero and Dante in this Ooh. demo so obviously the fast fluid combo fantastic combat you know from devil may cry is back and better than ever it looks beautiful it feels great and boy oh boy taking down demons with dual motorcycle blades is the funnest thing I never knew I wanted in a video game. <laughs> <laughs> I need to Google what the fuck a motorcycle blade is. Um, so it has an official name. Let me look up. Oh, those look neat. Let me look up what the name of these things are. Oh, wait. Is this no, I don't want a YouTube thing. video. No. <laughs> She's looking are up the sharp? Thing. I'm confused. If they're blades, they're probably sharp. I know, but on uh, on the actual motorcycle. So it's called the Cavalier. Um, so this is an actual weapon that you can... What's great about this is so it has a couple different forms. So in one, in one form, it's dual blades that you kind of... So when you're sawing at them, the wheel almost acts like a chainsaw. Nice. Um, and then there is a, a, a version where they come together and you ride the motorcycle... And then you can do a wheelie on the demons. And then, like, the wheels just, like, spin, like, damage into them as you're, like, popping a wheelie on their face. It's, it's like so a Lancer. Good. I mean, it's so satisfying. Crack. I can't yeah. even tell you how much fun it was. And then there's another move where you can, like, do, like, a spin on the motorcycle, like, on the ground. And, like, you, like, can do, like, damage in a circle on the motorcycle. And it just... It was so much fun, <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> I think Andrew had some anger to get out. I did, and it, I mean, like, obviously, it's like a super button mash heavy game, um, but it ju it just felt so it just felt so empowering. And there's obviously two other weapon sets that that you can use, and one of them is more of a very up close melee weapon where you have to get super super close. It's like where you where you're punching with these kind of like these glove things almost on your fists. And then there's uh, the traditional blade, which you can um, stand a little bit farther back. And certain enemies respond differently to certain weapons. So you really have to vary up your play style. You can't really lean too heavily on one weapon or the other, even though you're definitely going to develop a favorite. And it'll probably be the Cavalier because the motorcycle blades are the best. Um, but <laughs> um, not every enemy responds to that. So you have to really kind of make use of your entire arsenal and really learn all of these different combat techniques and these combos that you can string together. And it just, it just was really fun. I had a fantastic time playing as both Nero and as Dante. And, you know, they 
kind of have a little bit of a different play style. And I don't know all of the lore behind everything that, that happened in that demo, but I know that lots of DMC fans you know, are super stoked that so many of these franchise characters are back um, in this installment. And it was just, it was good, you guys. Like, I didn't think I was going to want to play this game because I'm going to admit that I'm lost. I'm super lost when it comes to the narrative because I haven't been, I haven't played DMC since like DMC 2, I think. Mm. DMC 3. So it's been, a, it's been a while and I didn't finish either of those games. I just kind of dabbled in them to try them out. But, um, but yeah, it's, it was really it's pretty fun. I played it at PAX West and I love the cheesiness of it. It reminds me of Bayonetta, right? I mean, I know that's probably not the most fair example to use because Bayonetta is much newer than no, Devil May Cry, it's but platinum though. Like that's their style. Yeah. There you go. There you go. It was really fun. I also enjoyed it. I played as Nero and he is a husbando material for sure. He's really sassy, really over the top. I played with a baby ass baby mode, auto lock system. That was the best way for me to play because it's all combo based and I just button mash and I hope for the best. So even I can do well in Devil May Cry 5. Thanks to baby ass baby mode. Yep. One day they'll call it that and it'll be great. One, one game, one of these days we'll do it and it'll be fantastic. I mean, the closest we have is Wolfenstein, don't hurt me, daddy. <laughs> Which we conned the phrase off of. Yeah. It's so. true. It's true. Um... But yeah, so TGS, it was cool. I got to play a VR race on a photon bike. I posted that video on my Instagram if you want to go check it out. That was wild. That thing was is going to be sold to arcades for between 2 and 4 million yen, the representative huh. told me, which is I think I believe around 20 to 40,000 dollars, which is that's, that's a lot of money for an arcade cabinet. Um, but it was really cool. It looked like Tron. I saw a bunch that of really PC amazing. Had... Wait, what? Sorry, that's it. The uh, la the PC station you were sitting in that was really oh, cool. Oh yeah, the gaming the gaming pod from Cooler yeah. Masters. So that I actually it was so ironic that I saw that at TGS because I just had seen like a CNET post about it from a different trade show, and I was like, ooh, that could get me back into PC gaming. And then I walked the floor of TGS, and I saw it there, and I was like, oh, my God, I have to sit in that thing. So that actually, like, um, reclines backwards, ooh. so you can kind of, like, tilt. It doesn't go fully flat or anything like that because it's, like, this, um, you know, like, moon-shaped pod. But they don't have a release date for it, and they don't have a price. It's like a prototype. And I was mm. like, dang it. It looked so pretty and it was so comfortable and I would buy it, but I have to imagine it's not going to be less than like $10,000 for that thing. Yeah. And none of the, none of the parts come included. I asked them if the monitor was at least included and they're like, no, oh, hot none damn. of the PC components are included. It's just like the chair with like the ha. mounting bracket for the monitor. And I was, like, some desk. I was like, dang, <sighs> but it would be so cool to have. It would. Was it was it pretty big to take up a lot of room? Not really. Um, I would say Brittany, if you don't lift the pillow up for your own sentence, I'm gonna oh, smack oh, shit. it. Sorry, thanks, girl. <laughs> Samer's got my back. <laughs> oh my god. Um, I would say the footprint is probably the same size footprint on like a floor as a love seat. Um, mm. you know, like uh, maybe three feet by four or five feet. You know, so it's not too, it's not too big. <laughs> I can't, I can't stop thinking about it now. Um, <laughs> that's what she said. Uh, <laughs> just hold the pillow up the whole time. Don't put it down. Yeah, it should just be in the background forever. I should just move my sign that I have like here, right behind my head. Yeah, yeah, you should. Um, but it was very um, interesting um, seeing TGS uh, from a different perspective because, you know, it's very different than a lot of the shows that we go to here in the States. While booth babes weren't prevalent there, they definitely still exist um, at TGS. And obviously, you know, uh, romance games are much bigger in Japan and are much different than they are here in, in the States or in other parts of the world. And that was also obvious. They had an area called the Romance um, Simulator Area. And it was like okay. romance VR games. And I was just like, okay. I was, I was intrigued, but is I didn't actually go VR over there and play VR software them. porn. 
it's like it's like VR hentai essentially. So like yeah. Uh, it's a hentai full on porn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Just making sure we're using the correct terms for what yeah. you saw. Well, I didn't see it. That's the thing. Oh, I just oh, saw oh. like the sign for it, and they didn't have any actual like nudity on those signs. But the girls were very close to being nude, very much exposing themselves in very, you know, flirtatious ways to put it mildly. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was interesting. I, I had a, I had a random question because one of the things that I loved about Tokyo was the fashion. The fashion scene in Tokyo is amazing. Like so, so many women that I saw were so smartly dressed and had on these really cool outfits and, I spent a lot of time shopping in Shibuya and Harajuku and I did a little shopping in Ginza and I just like loved, fell in love with the fashion in Tokyo. But what I noticed was that every woman I saw, like literally all of them with the exception of two the entire time I was there, all had high necklines, like high <laughs> necklines on everything, uh, <laughs> jackets, shirts, dress, dresses, workwear, everything, high neckline. And so I went out in like in a dress that had a lower neckline, like a tank top would. Like I'm not talking like I'm not wearing like a deep V, like J Lo at the Grammys or anything crazy. Um, sure. But I was just like I I I went to John and I was like, am I being indecent? Like uh, should I cover up? Is this weird? And he's like, no, you're fine. It's not a big deal. And I was like, yeah, but like none of the other women are exposing any part of their collarbone area, like at all. It's like everything's up to the neck. Uh, not like turtlenecks, but like there's nothing yeah, below like the neck. collarbone that's exposed. And yeah. I was like, okay. Um, so I asked somebody, I was like, I have like a cultural question to ask and I don't know if anybody can give me an answer. So I asked a couple different people, you know, like, is it that Japanese developers are kind of obsessed with boobs on their, on their female characters because Japanese women are more conservative, that they wear high collared stuff? Is that why? And some people were like, well, I don't think that's related. I go, you don't? <laughs> and somebody was like, well, you know, a lot of these developers came up in a different era, you know, like in the 80s and 90s, making video games was different. Just like entertainment was different, you know, like it was the era of like Animal House and Revenge of the Nerds and, you know, a lot more things that would be wildly unacceptable today. Um, and I was like, okay, well that, that might be it too. And I was like, yeah, but it just seems like so many Japanese games just have these characters with these wild, crazy boobs. With the like best physics ever where she takes like one step and they wiggle around in space. Yeah, and like the like, oh, Koei Tecmo, Tecmo games, right? Like the boob physics. Oh man. They work on those boob physics very, like that's a big part of their engine. <laughs> I know, man. They, they even made uh, points to talk about how. You know, their boob physics are improved year over year. Um, <laughs> and no one could give me an answer. So if you are Japanese or have spent a significant amount of time living in Japan, or if you're a Japanese developer or no one, and you have some insight, please write in to contact at whatsgoodgames.com and let me know if my theory is completely off base and I'm stupid. Or if like, hey, yeah, maybe you're right. I don't know. <laughs> Asking the important it's interesting questions. That you see that. I mean, granted, it's been years, so I don't remember. It's not a thing I really picked up on. Well, but somebody that told me that that's that just I the style right about. now, that it hasn't always been that way uh, with female fashion in Tokyo, but that it's just what's in right now. And I was like, okay. I, I, I said, I don't know any. I've never been to Tokyo before. I just It was just something I noticed because literally every woman had these necklines, all the same necklines. So, And I bought a ton <laughs> of shirts. I bought a ton of stuff when I was there. I'm very excited to wear them. Ooh. Very fun. Yay. Anyway, We're all losing our minds. That's it. I'm, I'm, done. I'm done talking about TGS now. I ate so much ramen, you guys. I can't eat ramen oh, anymore. Oh, I want ramen so bad. Oh. Just dream about it. Mm, ramen, delicious. Oh, sweet oh, ramen. Mm. <laughs> Don't describe food to me, Simer. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, do you ladies have have any questions or anything you would like to add before we wrap up the show? Uh, crickets. No. no, crickets. It's just crickets. No, it, you said you thought the show would go three hours, and it almost almost went three I hours. Made it. 
Almost, yeah. We right. covered, covered a lot of good things. We're going to miss you these following two weeks, Andrea Renee. Aw, thanks. I'm going to miss you too. I'm so tired and I haven't even left yet. <laughs> yeah, that's that sounds about right. That's... <laughs> But this is a, this is a relaxation vacation, right? Like you're just going to chill. Yes. Yeah, so unlike my previous two um, outings out of the country, this is this is something I planned with my mom forever ago. She has never been outside North America, and she's never been to Europe. And I wanted to take her, and so we planned this this vacation, and it just happened to fall at this time of the year. So sadly, we're missing New York Comic Con. I know some people have reached out to ask if we will be there. We will not be in New York uh, next weekend. Um, but as we mentioned at the top of the show, we will be going to TwitchCon. But yeah, so I'm hoping to be able to unplug. And, you know, like I said, I'm going to try not to bring my console, even though I probably will. Um, <laughs> so that way, you know, I can I can I can focus on, you know, just having a having a good time with my mama and, mm -hmm. you know walking around Italy and looking at stuff that's really old and pretending yeah. like I'm in Assassin's Creed and eating really good food hopefully <laughs> yeah I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna bring that up Steimer oh shit I'm sorry we're not supposed to be talking it's because about I'm so tired I just I don't I'm like a goldfish right now I don't have the attention span <laughs> It's okay we're all ladies and gentlemen I'll keep this very quick long story short I am drinking powdered powdered drinks for three weeks that's all I can eat that's all I can drink and the my my mom was over today, and she gave my dog turkey bacon, dog turkey bacon, and I almost tackled him for it because it just sounds so good. When you're so, contemplating dog food, you know that you're starving. Life's rough. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, All right, put the podcast, we're done. Oh, man. Uh, just so you guys don't get worried, she is under doctor supervision, and she's going back to see her doctor tomorrow to check in. Yeah. At which point I'm, we I'm, told we told her, tell your doctor to give you more of these powder things. You need more of them. <laughs> I know. I'm A okay. It's to treat a weird digestive gut thing. And I'm sure I'll talk about it more next week because I'm probably gonna be even more out of it than I am this week. But it's fine because you love me unconditionally. And I'll have my rock solid stimer there to hold me up. Exactly. Don't you roll your eyes at me? This no, I'm laughing at me being the idea of me being rock solid. You are rock solid stimer. I'm being eroded by Damn. a river. It's fine. <laughs> Oh my gosh, like the river of life, it's eroding you down. Yeah. What's what? Of course, isn't that what it's supposed to do? No, gosh, I hope not. <laughs> oh, all right. Sure it is. That's how we all die. Anyways, let's go. Oh boy. <laughs> Friends, this has been fun. We hope you enjoyed the show. As always, please connect with us on social media. You can find us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. If you cannot afford to be part of patreon.com slash what's good games that's not a problem please just drop us a, a rating on itunes maybe leave us a review maybe hit that subscribe button on youtube or give us a thumbs up or hit notifications all of that support helps us here at what's good games and we thank you so much for being part of our fantastic community have a wonderful weekend and we'll be back with more video games next week bye everybody